We're starting now. Good evening and welcome to the school board study session. It's Monday, June 15, 2020 and it's 6 p.m. Uh, today, uh, this study session will be conducted via Hangouts Meet. It is being live streamed by BEC TV and will be replayed for the usual BEC TV replay schedule. So I am going to do roll call for attendance of board members. Uh, so please uh, let us know that you're present. Director Beth Beebe. Your microphone is off. Here. Thank you. Director Tom Bennett. Here. Director Maya Olson. Here. Director James Sorum. Here. Director Heather Starks. Here. Director Don Steiger. Here. And Nelly Corman is present. I think I'm having issues with my microphone here. Um, okay, so the first item in the agenda today. Oh, and this is this is a study session, so it's a more informal type of format that the the regular school board meeting is. Um, so I probably won't be addressing you as directors, but just on there with your names, your first names. Okay, so um, the first item in the agenda today is the fall planning survey results, and I will be calling uh, Mr. Rick Huffman for this presentation tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair, Superintendent Fujitaki, members of the school board. It is my pleasure to present to you the results of our surveys that we uh, shared. I'm just going to pop up on the screen. The uh, return to school survey staff and family results. Um, I hope you can see that. If I can get a, a verbal from anyone. Yep, looks good. Great, thank you. So what uh, I'm gonna present to you the, the staff survey results first and then we'll share the family results and then I'll open up for questions. I just have a few slides. So the Staff survey methodology was emailed to all employees. It was in the field for 10 days, May 19th through the 29th. All responses were this. We received over 1,500 uh, respondents to the survey for a response rate of 71%, which is phenomenal, quite frankly. Um, and another 606 open-ended responses, including 81 from substitutes, uh, staff members, and I'll share a slide of their uh, involvement as well. Um, uh, there were 207 uh, substitutes that actually participated in a survey, thanks to Mary Burroughs and HR and sending that out to our list of substitute staff members. Um, I wanna say on the open-ended responses, we're still doing some analysis of that um, for both staff and for parents. In this next slide, you'll see that, um, actually I wanna put this on present. What you see on this next slide is the breakout by employee groups. And here's where you will actually see um, how, uh, how high in terms of the response rate. Our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our clerical personnel and health associates, the participation rate exceeded the minimum number that's needed to generalize results with a 5% margin of error. Um, it's indicated as the asterisk. And you'll see for our uh, teachers, uh, clerical and health associates, you know, health associates 100%, but 90, uh, nearly 100% for teachers and clerical and our parents were over 80%. We saw a decrease in participants um, uh, with some of our groups, even though uh, we, we concerted efforts to make sure that they had access to complete the survey. But even still, all these response rates were uh, significantly higher than what we typically see when we survey staff. Community Ed, you'll see it's uh, most of these employees, majority of these employees 
our hourly employees. So we expected to see a smaller uh, grouping. Um, I should point out that there were 162, um, I'm, I'm sorry, that's on the family one. Uh, I'll get that. So the big question for both fans was the intent to return to school this fall. So very simply, we asked staff, do you plan to return to school in the fall? And you can see majority of them uh, do plan to return to school, to school in the fall, over 77, uh, about 77 staff. Uh, about 16% were uncertain and a uh, very small percent or no. And then uh, just over 6% had requested work from home accommodations because of health reasons, either for themselves or for members of their family. Um, this shows you the intent to return my position. And again, you'll see the majority of our staff and all of our employee groups had indicated, yes, that they plan to return to school, but the, uh, the next highest uncertainty um, also reflected that throughout. What is uh, what we did in this next one was to ask specifically upon returning to school would improve or uh, in terms of your comfort level to or would it change the school? So as you can see, the majority of our staff members are comfortable with some concerns and I'll address those in a minute here. We also had um, about a quarter of our popular employees were split between somewhat comfortable and not at all comfortable and just percent that were comfortable, no concerns indicated. And then again, you'll see by empty groups, the comfort level returning by position. And again, for the most part, um, it was uniform in terms of uh, comfortable with, with concerns indicated in the green bar and uh, somewhat comfortable in the red. And then again, it's equal, somewhat equal distribution based on the number of employees that participated by group, the comfort level. So then when we asked the question is, is, okay, what would help or what is it that would make you feel more comfortable? So those that indicated comfortable with concern, these were the top seven. Um, any third, these were, uh, didn't even uh, register five. So you'll see very clearly where our staff is uh, strongly supportive of in terms of comfort factors, ensure that there's adequate uh, uh, cleaning supply. What I mean by this, hand sanitizers, in classrooms and office spaces, equal access to that, as well as cleaning spaces, um, significant numbers of staff. And again, when we broke this down by all employee group, similar across the board, and then you see the other 80% was the Minnesota Department of Health guidelines. And these are the guidelines of social thing, in some cases, wearing of masks, and uh, other we expect to see that will be coming out of MD and Minnesota Department of Health. In terms of staff health screening, so for those of you that may not, we're not aware that in our child care and in our food operation this year, this the, when we were enclosed, and any building had to do a staff health screening, so our workplace, which was um, answer questions, what, did you have a fever, do you have a cough, any respiratory illness or feelings of that nature. And if that was the case, then they're allowed to work that day or um, until they, those symptoms subside, or in some cases, if they were being tested for COVID-19. So staff indicated that they would expect a comfort level. He continued to do that daily health screening. It is interesting as I reviewed the responses, both for parents and for staff, that there is a deep concern for members and parents sending children to school that are or are sick or coughing. And um, so I think why this was uh, rated significantly up there. And PPE had more to do with the wearing of masks, distancing, and student health screening. So again, um, all of these were the tops among all the employee groups. Um, relative. So then when we asked the question, would you be willing to wear a mask here that a majority of the employee groups did indicate that yes, they would wear a mask. Um, but you'll see a significant number um, indicated that sometimes, in other words, in the open-ended responses that they support wearing a mask in areas where there are lots of people of doing their job. For example, a teacher, um, teachers express the 
concern about wearing a mask and not being able to connect with students or, or the inflections of their voice in delivery of an assignment to our talking and how that mask might would uh, quite frankly mask their voice their ability to connect with students so that's where you see that sometimes came in and shows up in the open-ended responses and then um, certainly there's a, a spattering of folks that simply said no that they did not favor wearing a mask in school, even though right now that is the current CDC and MDH guidelines. And what's interesting here is our personnel and our child care, but food service really was our was our test case over the last two nights because staff were required to wear masks, um, practicing social distancing. And we found that to be an adjustment, we took some adjusting because staff would often wear their masks, but would have them down or not cover their mouth or their nose. And that uh, it was just a constant reminder to let people know that it was in their best interest and for their coworkers as well. And then another we can return when, with respect to the staffers. This is where we ask very similar questions to the intent to return in the fall. And you'll see most of our students do fall within the teacher and the paraprofessional ranks. Um, and then we do dual uh, roles in terms of substitute for food service and paras or teachers. But by and large, the majority of them do say yes, that they plan to return in the fall. What this e equates out to um, remains to be seen in terms of once the guidelines come out and, and really truly whether there will have uh, substitutes in the fall. But um, with budget did occur in our district and in other districts, there is some belief that will have substitutes when needed. But in this case, it does indicate plan uh, to return in the fall. Let's talk about the uh, parent survey again. It was emailed to all how um, it was in the field at the same time, 10 days, May 19th through the 29th. MS responses, and we received nearly 3,800 responses. Pretty phenomenal. Um, and another 1,300 responses. And this is why it's taken us a little bit longer to do an analysis on the open ended responses. And, uh, but we're it, it really breaking it down for us and, and will give us some good data. So, what you see here is the response rate by grade level, and in all cases other than early childhood or preschool, again, uh, the responses exceeded the minimum number needed to generalize the results with a 5% margin of error. Um, and it, in, you will see when we have the parents or guardians that yes, that in, would indicate that they had a child in uh, three or four, two or even one grade level. So that's why you'll see that there's actually uh, numbers are reflected in the parents and guardians, but the response rate again, over three per four K through 12 parents, um, uh, again, higher than what we typically would see in a survey to parents that particularly uh, of this nature went to a, a broad expanse of families. And the, really the question is, do you intend to send your child or children to school in fall? And the majority, as you see, 64% indicated yes, that they would be sending their children to school. We had about a third of them that responded that uh, uncertain, and I'll talk about uncertainty in more detail here in a minute. But a very small percentage that indicated um, uh, no, or the other option was that they would, um, uh, for health reasons, uh, other accommodations, and uh, whether that was online or or uh, some other way that they didn't intend to send their child to school, but would be looking for some other kind of accommodations. Now, when we broke this down by level, you will see again, rather than our early childhood, and by the way, of the early childhood, uh, were uh, about 120 parents indicated at the survey. And I also should point out that we uh, had the survey translated and we had 162 uh, Spanish responded to the Spanish survey and 14 Somali uh, parents responded. Those numbers are reflected in these. Uh, the, the, the issue tonight, we did add all these together. So you will see across the three levels, pretty consistent of an intent to return to school. But again, we need to look at those uncertainties. Um, that's a significant number level, and certainly at early childhood, the uncertainty level. The uh, question then is in terms of no or uncertain on the survey, 
it comes to the question, which educational delivery option did you your child? And 71% um, said hybrid. As you know, the traditional school, some part of the week or day in school and some part of the week or day that they're um, at form of remote learning. And as we develop our fall, the, the fall the delivery options, this is important things that's working on that. What's also interesting is we had about that indicated online only. And uh, another favor going to having, sending their child back to school at all, that they fail option only. And then uh, just under 2% uh, homeschool and uh, just over a percent that or wish to enroll their child into a private school or enroll. These were for those individuals that just indicated no on that previous question. If you look at the level, again, you'll see distance. Um, we identify this as distance in blue, but what that really is is the, um, that corresponds with individuals that said they want to take online courses only for a variety of safety reasons. They posted to uh, indicate the hybrid, as you can see, equally distributed across the uh, four levels, particularly um, people that took the survey at each one of those levels. Coming back. So we asked them, what are the primary concerns you as a parent have for your children returning to school? As you can see, the first one says, um, what's not on there is the, it says rooms or gathering sites that are not disinfected. So this is our staff as well. Again, parents indicated by 62% to make sure that they're is adequate hand sanitizer and washing during the day as well as classrooms that are locating to be cleaned on a daily basis. They also said uh, that what would, would, would be concerning to them is health, that health guidelines were not where they identified with the MDH guidelines at six foot distance. And then um, a number of them by the way, this was an open, um, so they, they were able to identify the ability or availability to reinforce to making sure that their kids were sanitized, not only hand sanitized, but hand washing throughout the day. Uh, the other concern actions has had to do with how large students would be returning to school classrooms or in cafeterias, uh, passing periods nature. There was concerns, obviously, with the readjustment to schools reflected in some of the other survey data that shows that parents have a concern about readjusting to school after being out for a very extended period of time. Transportation and child care and care for family uh, rounded out. Um, there were a lot, but none of them were over 2%. But transportation and child care and for family. Under transportation, this is very important to us because as we developing our fall planning, we know that at least based on the current age guidelines, our buses can't transport the same number of students we've done in the past on a daily basis or for each ride. of the workforce. And then the care for family really showed up here because a number of the respondents, a majority of the respondents were either teachers in our district or teachers in other district. And because not all districts will have the same educational delivery uh, uh, exact replication, they'll have, they have similar models. The question and concern that they had is that if they were teaching in Bloomington and their child was at home, that creates an issue for them that it doesn't align with when they would be home and their child would be at school. And uh, similar, uh, similar uh, stories or reflections on that as well. So with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions and um, I'm going to re remove this uh, and return to so I can see y'all. I'll leave this up there. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, questions. Please raise your hand. I think I can see you all in my grid. Uh, Maya. 
So I'm just wondering um, if you broke it down as far as teachers being comfortable to return to school, do you have an idea as to what grades they teach because, um, because you know, teach or what classes they teach because te teachers who are teaching, uh, you know, early childhood or kindergarten or special education will have uh, more trouble with distancing from their children. So we didn't go, we didn't uh, have any questions that broke it down by that. What I was looking for here, um, Direct Wilson, here it is, is we were able to uh, disaggregate for that no, yes, or uncertainty or other accommodations. And majority of staff that were, that were uncertain, if you look at all the employee groups, the largest number of uncertainty uh, came from our teacher group. I think I showed you that slide. Um, and um, but it didn't indicate for them whether it was a special ed teacher or a early childhood teacher. We didn't disagree. Yeah, I was looking at the number of teachers that um, were uncertain about coming back and remembering that we've had a substitute shortage. Um, and given that, I'm wondering, would we, you know, where would we get these teachers? You know, because I thought, well, maybe we can get a long call um, sub for this coming year for some of those, or, um, you know, do we, you know, depending on the hybrid model, you know, and how it's laid out, um, do some do distance learning. I actually sent an article out to um, to some, and if, if our school board members, um, get the AMSD um, newsletter, there was a really excellent article in there about what is happening um, throughout the world and how they're going back to school. And, um, and so I don't know if this is the time for that, but I, I'm looking at what we have here and I'm just curious to know how confident you are, Rick, that we will have enough teachers. Um, are other schools cutting budgets and also uh, dropping positions so there's more people available to come into our sub pool or that we can hire on? Um, would this be something where there's, um, you know, someone can request a leave of absence given the COVID virus so that um, they they could still maintain, um, you know, their their tenure and seniority, but because of the situation, they would prefer not to be on campus. So these are all really good questions. And I think I uh, will preface the, re the response is that this was a snapshot in time. And I think if we were to do that survey, maybe in a week or two, it might be changed. We do intend to do another round of surveys of staff as well as parents. Um, for, for a variety of reasons, obviously. One is I think a lot of people are waiting to see two things. One, what will be the guidance from MDH? And two, what will be the fall, those educational models? What do they look like? As you know, um, you received as well as our parents and staff, we provided communication just before we uh, left uh, for, for our summer break about the fall uh, educational models that have been developed and, and over that period of time in the last three weeks or two weeks, there's been significant amount of work that uh, John Weiser and Katrina and uh, Mesro and Rachel Jens and and a whole host of other folks that are working on those. They've done a monumental work. That once we start to share that information, we expect that the, the, the surveys that we will do will be more representative sampling and we'll do demographics to be able to break that down. So they're really good questions, but. All those answers and make sure those same kind of substitutes again and making sure that they're aware of that information so they can make informed choices so you know i would say uh too early to tell right now yeah yeah well thank you very much i really enjoyed reading this and um kind of wanting to know out there what what was happening what were people thinking and um you know what are the concerns so this was i think a, a really needed um, snapshot, as you call it, mm -hmm. and I think it's really helped us to get a better grasp of, of what we're working with. And then as we get these other snapshots, I think that that will really help. So thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Heather. Um, so kind of in that same line of thinking for, for future surveys or however we're talking to, um, to families and teachers, I'd be curious too about the responses for families who have either a child uh, in English language, an English language learner, or a special education student. Um, and I do not believe that you had to ask those questions, those demographic questions in this survey, um, but that would be uh, um, two subgroups, both from the family perspective and the teacher perspective, I'd be interested in if they have different perspectives about how, the importance of being in person versus being able to do distance learning. Um, and then the other, and I don't need an answer for this now, so this is a follow-up question for later, but when you had 162 Spanish-speaking families and 14 um, Somali uh, language families, I'm curious as to what percentage that is to our actual enrollment. I know surveys are really challenging to get out and to get answered, but I'm just curious as to how representative that is um, for those groups. Yeah, and we should, I should note too that I talked with uh, uh, Sophia and Hema who would do the translations for us. Um, and they both indicate that a number, uh, quite a few parents, we don't, again, we can't quantify it, will take the English version. In fact, they, that's uh, the first choice to, to take that. We do offer those other surveys for, obviously for families and 162 uh, Spanish speaking families taking the survey is, is, is helpful, but it, it's a good question. I will say the next survey will not be uh, sending it home like this. It will be a, um, it will be done a sampling, um, a 600, probably a 600 uh, family or parent survey that does break it into uh, demographics and allows us to survey between 110 and 120 um, each of our BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and uh, persons of color population so that we get a good stratification of all of those parents in our district. Um, and by those questions, we can disaggregate that. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Me, can you see me? Yes. This is, this is Jim. Okay. Um, yeah, as as you mentioned, this is a snapshot as of now, and the fact that it's only in June, and the economy picks up. A lot of people will probably be going back to uh, work, and then so that's going to change their minds a little bit too as they get into that. The big concern is the before and after school programming. And transportation with only 13% saying that that's a concern. Um, as we talked before, you know, if the Department of Education and Transportation says we have to do so much restricting of the students, you know, that's going to be a real issue that um, more than more than one parent. So as we see some more surveys coming up in July and at the end of July, you know, that's going to really be more, more helpful uh, with the understanding of this. But this is, this has been a good snapshot. And I know we've got a couple of more meetings where we're going to listen to Andy Kubis and John Weiser about some other of the, of the presentations. I know as a grandparent of five children in the district, and we go back to some kind of a hybrid class, uh, and my daughter being a teacher and husband and her husband being in the uh, Air National Guard, I suspect I'm going to wind up becoming a, a tutor or part-time teacher with with the situations the way they are now. And um, I'm kind of looking forward to that, but not really. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Don, you have a question. I just wanted to ask uh, Rick, um, maybe you said when the next survey would be going out, but I just wanted to make sure I caught that or it, did you not give a timeline? And and are we waiting until we do have more direction? Is that what you said?
What I think the next steps for us is twofold. We, we have expressed an interest in at least trying, maybe getting a snapshot, uh, what we call a brush fire survey of our BIPOC population um, to really indicate, uh, get a better sense of how many of, uh, of our parents of color that are interested in returning to school or hybrid or not, just so that it could, it is clearly uh, reflected in, in our work that uh, where we're going. And then once we get more of our information about our fall models out there, and I think it's really important that we uh, start to hone in on where parents are, what are they specifically in favor of? How many would choose online learning? How many are in favor of, of the traditional uh, model? And frankly, how many just want school to be back in the same way it's always been? Because we saw that in the open-ended questions. So in terms of timing, um, we'll do it when we, when we have uh, more information to be able to share. And uh, if we need to do another one, the closer we get to school, but I do believe in us for us to capture it, to really land on, on our models, we're gonna have to do it no later than mid to late July and probably more mid July. It's gonna be in the field at least two weeks to get the data that we need. Thank you. Heather. Heather. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on, you mentioned the open-ended questions. I know that from, uh, an organizational standpoint, that's a, that's a nightmare to put together. But as a parent who filled out the survey, I really appreciate the opportunity to have that open-ended you know, opportunity to say, well, this, the, the answers or the options I had didn't quite reflect what I'm thinking, or here is something that you know, I want to add. So I really do appreciate that when the surveys um, go out and they have that open-ended open piece, because I do feel like you're right, you get a little bit better flavor than just the multiple choice. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Maya? And that, that might tie in with what I was going to say too, because um, some of the same teachers who might have the most concerns as far as, you know, children who will not wear masks, for example, if they are on the autism spectrum or they're afraid of the teacher when the teacher has a mask on or young children and, um, children with special needs and children in special education, we have to work very closely with and one-on-one. -on -one. It's very difficult to put them in different corners and work with them. Um, and you use a lot of manipulatives like base 10 blocks, but at the same time, while they might have more concerns, they are also the ones I find that most want to work in person. They're the ones who have the concern about the distance learning because they really need that um, that connection with them. So yeah, it's just a concern that that I know that we're going to uh, have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Mr. Kaufman, so for that, you brought up the conversation about uh, the mask and uh, what the preferences of, of the different staff members um, is in terms of wearing the mask or not. Um, is there anything you can tell us about maybe the option of having the shield, wearing the shield, and, and how um, how effective is it? And in terms of cost, is there anything, any more information you can give us? Well, I mean, we do we we had shields and we were using shields. Um, so they the, some employees certainly liked using those over the masks. They felt they could breathe better. Um, uh, we didn't ask specifically about face shields. Particularly because the uh, we don't have the quantity we don't we don't have as much as we did with the mask. So, if we wanted to get that specific, we would certainly put that in the next um, survey too to identify would you prefer wearing a mask or a face shield. Okay, because I'd be curious to know too in terms of cost how how different that would be. Yeah, My CDC answer. would tell you um, they prefer. I mean, they would prefer both because you uh, it's just a double layer, an extra layer. Um, and, and part of it is educating um, staff and parents that persons that wear a mask is not for their protection, it really is protecting others around them. And that's why when the open-ended questions was when it came to staff, they really, they, there was a, 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 quite a few folks that talked about those guidelines that you're right, uh, Director Olson, that kids that, it's hard for kids to keep those masks on um, and they cough and they, 
sneeze and they don't cover them their nose. That is a concern that our staff expressed in those open-ended responses. But that um, my understanding is we can't require students to wear masks. We can require staff to wear masks, but um, that is uh, just that was brought up a, a number of times. Thank you, Maya. Are we looking into the the plexiglass um, shields? Or, you know around the desks? So Rod Sivkovich is leading a facilities planning group and uh, they're looking at all various different options. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions or thoughts? Board members? Beth. Yeah. Um, the concern about whether students are going to be able to get there, you know, given the restrictions by the um, Department of Health, um, you know, it's just a big question mark for me. And since attendance is so key to our students' learning, um, do you think that there might be a point where they um, uh, release or give us more leeway? on that if kids are wearing masks and if buses are sanitized? I think with three, 400 school systems in the state, the MDE is gonna to try to come out with something that is uniform and uh, will be guidelines that school districts will be expected to follow and guidelines that uh, would be strongly advised they follow. Um, they continue to collect feedback. In fact, we just received this, late this afternoon, a survey from MDE to send out to parents um, and uh, looking at that, I, it's a way for them just to try and assess. It, most of the questions are around distance learning. It wasn't the kind of questions that we asked. Um, so I think they're looking at uh, a small segment, but hard to say, um, Director Beebe, at, at this point again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, I guess we're ready to move on to our next item. Thank you, Mr. Thank Kaplan. You. Okay, so we're going to our next one, which is the distance learning survey results. And for this presentation, we have here tonight, Dr. Dave Heistad and Dr. Julio Cesar, and they're both from the Research Evaluation and Assessment Department. Thank you, uh, Chair Carmen. Um, Board Directors, um, Superintendent Fujitaki. Um, this uh, survey was, uh, was sent to all teachers um, and it focused on uh, aspects of distance learning. Um, I'm gonna present the quantitative results and then uh, Dr. Cesar will present the qualitative. The qualitative are quite interesting, um, and I think we're going to devote the most time to that. Uh, we had um, volunteers from the University of Minnesota. We had a team of qualitative experts work on uh, uh, calling the themes from the qualitative. We weren't able to get that in the board packet, so this will be the first time that you've had a chance to see those themes. I will start with um, the um, First theme uh, in the quantitative um, analysis um, uh, was an answer to a question about, um, I feel nervous when I think about current situations. And this, uh, this presentation was in the field at the time, not only of um, the pandemic, but also of the, um, the racial, um, and uh, uh, police uh, abuse situation. And so uh, it's not too surprising that 85% of the respondents agreed with that statement. But this general theme is that there was a lot of stress that teachers were experiencing. 80% uh, uh, worried about the health of their family members. Um, and 55% uh, said that they felt uh, stressed out about uh, leaving the house. Uh, there are other items in this category. So the general theme is it was difficult doing distance learning. Um, then we asked about uh, workload and uh, 
teachers, about 43% of the teachers said that there was much more time in planning for distance learning than in the typical situation. Um, and 43% said it was too much. 47% said it was about right. Uh, the amount of time communicating with parents, also 34% of the teachers said it was too much time compared to what would be optimal. 57% uh, said it was about right. And then uh, compared to face-to-face -face, uh, instruction, uh, assignments were being completed by students less frequently. And 70% of the teachers uh, agreed with that statement. Uh, only 20% of the teachers said um, it was about the same frequency of turning in assignments. So this was a, another source of, uh, of uh, worry uh, for teachers. Um, and uh, a lot of the qualitative uh, statements talked about the degree uh, to which students were actively engaging and completing assignments. Uh, the quality of work being submitted by the majority of students, 35, 46% uh, of the respondents said either somewhat poor or poor. So it wasn't just the quantity, but also the quality of the assignments. And then we asked a, a question about um, students participating online beyond just the attendance activities. So 64% of the respondents uh, of the teachers said yes, uh, but 27% said no. So that 27% of the teachers said the majority of their students were not participating beyond just taking attendance. So they might just sign in and then not participate in the instruction. And uh, as uh, Julio will uh, talk about, they were quite concerned about this percentage of students that were disengaged and uh, worried that the, the, the students that were already doing well were uh, completing their assignments and the students that were already having difficulties tended not to engage. Um, now, some of the positives, 80% uh, of the teachers uh, agreed that the tools and resources provided for teaching during distant, uh, distant learning uh, were, um, were adequate. Um, and, um, and, and that was good. And it, it goes along with um, another positive that 92% of the teachers felt that they were being supported by their district administration, by their building administration. And then I didn't put this slide up, but three fourths said they thought they were being supported well by district uh, administration. So um, there were lots of uh, comments in, in a qualitative praising individual administrators, people in technology that were problem solving and uh, people providing uh, support uh, with mental health and, and other um, social emotional uh, concerns. Um, then uh, we asked several questions that are on the state survey uh, about uh, feeling, um, uh, having symptoms of depression. And it turns out that over 50% of the teachers were experiencing some of these symptoms. Uh, 49% uh, were feeling down. Uh, student uh, Teachers were saying they were either sleeping too much or too little, eating too much or too little, um, and not having the same kind of interest in daily activities. So, um, you know, that's something to uh, be very mindful for when we're looking at supports for teachers. Um, and finally, uh, another positive was that 47% of the teachers said that they would be willing to uh, participate um, in uh, summer professional development uh, for fully online programs. So if we um, end up having a fully online program, um, there were a lot of teachers that said that they would be interested. So th now I'm going to turn it to Julio and he will take you through the qualitative um, uh, survey. Um, 
qualitative uh, responses on the teacher survey. And then we'll uh, break for questions and then we'll go into the, um, the parent survey. Um, we put out a parent survey near the beginning of distance learning. And then we have another survey that's just come back uh, near the end of distance learning for parents to give both quantitative and qualitative responses. And so Julio will take you through that too. Um, but first of all, I'd like to, you know, just indicate again that we had a lot of support. Our, our two interns that are working with us this summer worked all weekend on the qualitative stuff and our friends from the University of Minnesota were quite helpful. It's all yours, Julio. Absolutely, thank you, Dave. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, board members, uh, superintendent, and everyone else on this board call. Um, as Dave mentioned, uh, I will be presenting the qualitative results that were compiled by some wonderful folks uh, from the University of Minnesota. That's uh, Dr. Shaver and Lana Peterson um, that have been working with the computer science education team, um, as well as uh, some of the folks that Dave mentioned from RIA, Rick Lamb, and Chin Chow. Uh, in total, we had 197 elementary teachers, um, 89 middle school teachers, and 103 high school teachers responded, responding to the survey, specifically to four questions, uh, which we're kind of focusing on these results right now. Um, first, what was working well for the teachers during distance learning, and what was not working well? Uh, and additionally, we asked them what was working for their students, and what was not working from their students, and from their perspective. Um, the data will be displayed by site levels. So as you can tell, we're going to start uh, with reported data from the elementary teachers on what worked well for them during distance learning. The top three, th the top three themes um, that you can see from the teachers dealt with technology support from the school and the district. They felt very supported um, through their questions about technology uh, from both the school and the district. Um, teachers also reported that professional development and teamwork uh, were supportive, and school and district communication uh, were great. On the other hand, um, they reported what didn't work well for them, and that included ineffective or lack of communication from both parents and students. And that's over 55% of the teachers who responded to that. Uh, they also had difficulties with lesson planning, instruction, and assessment. Um, students showing low engagement, uh, as well as teachers stating that there was too much workload to implement distance learning in such a period of time. For middle school teachers, uh, they shared that the content delivery was working well for them during distance learning, as well as the flexibility for both their own work and their students' work as well as the professional development opportunities that were available. What didn't work uh, for these teachers was the lack of contact between students and themselves, and also um, guiding students through collaboration and meetings. The lack of accountability for the students' work, and again, student engagement, uh, trying to attempt to engage they're not participating students. For high school teachers, uh, course teaching and teacher collaboration and communications were the top things shared, as well as teacher technology efficiency, where teachers rose to the occasion by being prepared for remote teaching and their willingness to learn. On the other hand, high school teachers struggled with student engagement and student and parent communication. They also struggle with course design and delivery, as well as some equity issues, where especially dealing with language and technology access barriers that they saw at the forefront, um, especially when trying to communicate with the families. Um, as presented before, we also asked teachers to give their perspective on what aspects of distance learning are working and not working well for their students. For elementary students, uh, teachers reported that Google Meets and other technology apps worked well, um, although these accounted for one out of four uh, for Google Meet and one out of five uh, teachers for the other apps. Uh, communication and lessons plan, instruction and assessment also worked well. Again, only one out of four teachers reported that, so just keep in mind. 
keep that in mind. Um, elementary teachers also reported that there was an efficient interaction between them and their students. And that students were struggling to complete their work. And that there was insufficient student support from families. Half of the middle school teachers who participated in the survey reported that students were thriving because distance learning provided them with an independent and flexible schedule and work environment. A third of the teachers reported that the content delivery was working well for their students. And 18% reported that students had access to teachers and that was working for their students. On the other hand, uh, similarly to what was not working for teachers, um, Lack of accountability was reported, but a little more than half of the teachers, including lack of engagement. Uh, asynchronous in instruction did not seem to be working well for students. And 21% reported that students were having issues at home. High school teachers, similarly to the middle school teachers, pointed out that flexibility of distance learning was working well for their students. 17% also noticed that students' um, access to devices and Wi-Fi worked well for them. And about 17% noticed improvement in student engagement. However, 35% of high school teachers noted that engagement was not working well for their students, especially lack of motivation and a lack of routine. The workload seemed to be set, the second issue brought up by 22% of the high school teachers, with some students having too much work and some having too little work. And this seemed to vary with those having to balance school work with responsibilities at home. Lastly, uh, too many technology platforms seem to be an issue for students to work through. This was also apparent in the parent guardian survey quality results, uh, qualitative results that will, that will be forthcoming as the University of Minnesota and the research evaluation assessment teams are analyzing that data as we speak, uh, which it also includes the Bloomington uh, Public School Student Survey qualitative results. So um, we'd like to take questions about the um, staff um, survey of distance learning before Julio goes through the, the family survey if there are any questions. Any questions? Tom, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, uh, well, first of all, doctors, thank you very much and congratulations to our newest doctor, Dr. Thank Julio. Um, I know you, you busted your butt to get it done and it's always great to have another uh, doctor on the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Oh. And my question is, um, I don't know if you guys have any baseline information that could, you can you can kind of compare the two, because I'm wondering if the problems that we're having with engagement and timely work completion, if those were kind of the same before we went to distance learning, or if this is like a huge increase that we're seeing. Uh, I just don't know if you were able to find any any data that could answer any of that those questions. Well, we had several questions that asked the staff to compare uh, distance learning to uh, regular instruction uh, bef before COVID-19. And it, it did appear that the, uh, the extra uh, stress, the extra uh, workload and uh, you know, feelings of anxiety were all things that uh, were apparent during distance learning that that weren't as a, apparent beforehand. Uh, okay, yeah, I know it's kind of hard to find the, the answer to that, but it's just yeah, yeah. We didn't, we hadn't done this particular survey in the past uh, because it focused on distance learning. Okay, thank you, Maya. Oh, I was just thinking that I I was. Um, thinking it looked good that the majority of teachers thought that it was just the right amount of work. Um, 
but I'm concerned because they, is it correct that they have not been teaching every subject yet on distance learning? So distance learning in the spring did not include um, social studies, science, and health, for example? Uh, for the high school teachers, I think that's uh, correct. That It was a little bit less load. Um, and Julio, did, did you think that the uh, feeling of being overworked was more prevalent among the um, elementary teachers? Um, I think it was pretty, you saw that across all three sites. Um, okay. it, it was the amount of, not necessarily the amount of work that they needed to put into distance learning, but prepping yeah. um, and doing the prep time, taking away from what they could be doing, instructing time. Uh, and also a, a lot of the teachers who mentioned that, they also had, kids and their homes or family members that they were looking after that also took away from it. So it was almost a battle between um, uh, putting together these materials for students and also try uh, dealing with their family needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't overwhelm them, uh, that they weren't uh, overwhelmed for the spring when they had so little time to prepare for that. Yeah. Um, we seem to be having a, an echo issue. I don't know if anybody else is, is hearing it. And I don't know. I see that we're um, in, the, in the presenting screen. So I don't know if there's a, a document that we need to close there or a window or a, there you go, the staff presenting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Some technical issues. Uh, thanks. Any other questions? Don. Okay. I, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to uh, thank John and the technology team. Uh, as you can see, um, everybody said they, or mo the majority of people said they were well supported. And you know, it's not just the teachers, it's all of us too. So um, I just wanted to thank them for doing such a great job on the technology side through all of this. Tom. Yeah, I guess this question would probably be for uh, Jenna or Les. Um, so we're taking this information and we're seeing that we're having issues with engagement. Um, I don't know if you guys feel confident that when we start up in the fall, since it's going to be a likelihood that we're going to be having some type of either hybrid or stay at home model that we would be able to address, make changes to address this engagement to hopefully improve upon that. I don't know if either of you could touch on that. Uh, that's uh, a very good observation. I, I think um, uh, Julio and I were asked to think about um, areas that the board might want to set goals uh, related to the survey information. And the number one area that we thought we could all work on was the engagement. And so whatever model that we come up with to see that we have students that are motivated, that are getting enough support, and that uh, uh, the issues that, that were raised by, by teachers, and you're gonna hear s some similar issues by parents, um, can be addressed so that we have a higher quality and quantity of engagement. Board member Bennett, I'd like to respond to that. Learning curve, teachers have more time to prepare. We're very hopeful that there's gonna be more improved engagement this fall. Okay, thank you. Done. I just want to say it was interesting that one of the statements or comments was that the same students that aren't engaged in the classroom are the same students that weren't engaged in online, that they were drawing a, a a comparison or whatever to that and I thought well if we could find a way
from the online engagement. But I think that that general worry that the gaps are getting bigger because the kids that were engaged and were being successful in their schoolwork before COVID-19 now we're taking off, whereas the other students are actually losing ground. And so we're all quite worried about how big the gaps are gonna be when we do our assessments in the fall. Yeah. Other comments, questions? Well, Maya? Just speaking of assessments, I mean, maybe that's not something to answer right now, but I'm curious how that's going to look online too. Um. Um, if if we end up with a fully online, with where there's no face-to-face uh, -face interaction with teachers, we're going to have to postpone the assessments. The assessments we use aren't standardized for at home, with parents being the proctors. So we're planning for in school hoping for a hybrid uh, model where we can have assessments in the classroom. But we've got a lot of time before we reach that point. Uh, if, if you'd like, Chair Corman, we could move on to the parent survey results. Uh, Julio has both quantitative and qualitative results from the first check-in that we did with parents. And then we asked the same questions at the end of school, and we'll be putting that together uh, in a short period of time. Yeah, Dr. David, just have a, a quick question. And yeah, sure. I can't so relate to many of the comments that were given by, by teachers. Um, but when you, um, when you ask the teachers about this engagement part of the survey, did they um, give a specific information about who their students were, or the demographics of the kids that uh, were not as engaged? And, um, and the reasons that they got from their students of why they were possibly unable to stay engaged. Julio, do you want to take that one? Uh, sure. So specifically, we did not. Uh, most of the questions that were uh, returned in the qualitative um, responses were pretty much what teachers were uh, offering on their own on their own observations so we do not have that kind of information um what would be nice though is to follow up maybe with teachers to see if they can give us some additional information specifically to those um groups that we might want to look into okay thank you okay we can move to the next one Second. Great. Um, so uh, this is the listen, distance learning survey that we that was given out to parents and guardians. This was sent out uh, on April twenty sixth, and the la and we closed it on May fifth. Um, in total, uh, two thousand six hundred and seventy five parents and guardians responded to the survey. Uh, Pre-K only household only accounted for about 40 of those families, meaning that there were families who had kids with pre-K, but also in uh, elementary or middle or high school. Uh, these number of parents and guardians represent approximately 45% of all the students in Bloomington Public Schools. That's about 4,499 students. About 71% of those uh, parents and guardians identified as white, 8% identified as Hispanic Latino, 7% uh, preferred not to answer, 6% uh, Black African, 5% Asian, 2% identified as two or more, 1% Native American, and 1% did not provide an answer, uh, and two families identified as Pacific Islanders. Uh, the majority reported that their children did not receive a free and reduced lunch, uh, with 16.4% receiving uh, free and reduced lunch. Um, here are some comments uh, that uh, found about their feelings of distance learning. I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, minutes to kind of read through them.
and should not equate to lowered expectations from either the staff or students. Um, however, families also shared many positive comments regarding distance learning. One specific one said, both of my children light up every time when they are their teacher, when they hear their teachers' voices. They really love and miss their teachers. And it has been special as a parent to see how dear teachers really are to children. They also share some positive feedback about the district. Um, I am really grateful to Bloomington Public Schools fraternity for their hard work, mostly at this time. Uh, and as mentioned before, we are still working on the massive amount of uh, qualitative data that we have, and we'll be, we'll be uh, showing similar results that we did for the teachers once we have them in. Regarding the quali qual uh, quantitative results, only five families reported not having access to a computer or a tablet to do their, uh, their schoolwork. And only about 20 families either reported that their children did not have daily access to the internet or did not provide an answer. That is 99.2% of families reported having daily access to the internet. Out of the 20 families without daily access to the internet or did not provide an answer, the majority were of Hispanic Latino background. But again, these numbers are really small. So just mainly focus on the number rather than the percentage. So we have about 77 Hispanic Latino families, about four white, four black, African, uh, two Native Americans, two did not uh, answer, and two or more uh, were one family who did not have or were unknown. When parents and guardians were asked about the amount of schoolwork their children are receiving from their teachers, almost two out of three parents and guardians stated that the amount of work was just the right amount. About 14% stated that it was too little, and 16% stated that it was too much. And about 212 families did not know. When asked about how much time per day their children spent on schoolwork during a week period, the amount varied between race and ethnicity groups. Uh, from 24% of Native Americans to 46% of white families reporting that their children spent four or more hours during schoolwork per day. And everybody's pretty much in high 50s or low 60s. Uh, for four hours or more. Regarding technology issues, uh, two out of three families reported that their children encounter some obstacles with technology. So maybe yes, one time, yes, a few times, or yes, many times. Out of these families, only 43% reached out to Bloomington Public Schools for help with these difficulties. And three out of four who did reach out stated that their technical difficulties, difficulties were addressed satisfactorily. 77% of families agreed or strongly agreed that teachers provided them with clear directions for their children's distance learning work. 22% of families agreed or strongly agreed that their children were not engaging in schoolwork, even though they were trying to motivate them. Please remember this number for later. One out of four parents uh, the other three questions posed to families and white families didn't differ significantly. Difference of 2%, difference of about 3%, difference of about 4%, now with families being a little bit more overwhelmed, posted to families. Regarding additional supports, 86% of families did not need any additional support with helping their children with distance learning. Out of those who did report needing additional support, only 27% reported that they knew how to request additional support. That means that seven out of 10 families that reported needing additional support did not know or kind of knew how to request distance learning support. 
remember this number too. For those reporting needing additional support, the majority reported needing some support of social and emotional learning, navigating online educational uh, tools, enrichment reading materials, educational app recommendations, and others. Additionally, 6% of families requested more information about meal programs. That is close to 100 families with this request who provided contact information. When we asked families to what extent do these statements apply to them during the week, 90% of families felt little, mostly or very calm and relaxed with 10% not being calm and relaxed at all. One out of four families reported feeling mostly or very nervous when they thought about current circumstances. 5% reported feeling very stressed about leaving their house. 9% reported being very or mostly worried about their health. Whereas 24%, that's one out of four families reported being very or mostly worried about the health of their family members. With this information, we were able to make a list of needs for those families who reported that needed or requested and provided contact information. In short, um, all families who requested more information about meal programs were contacted. 106 out of 117 families were contacted regarding support with navigating online tools and educational app recommendations, approximately 91% of them. Out of uh, 17 families who requested technology support, five were contacted. The rest is unknown by REA and they're still pending. For families who requested social emotional learning resources, an SEL resource list was created and it was shared with all. Approximately 51 out of 146 families have been contacting regarding mental health support thus far. And lastly, all families who requested online reading materials were contacted by Bloomington Public School staff. As far as uh, recommendations from uh, REA, oops, my apologies. Um, a large number of families, approximately 73%, that were looking for additional support did not know or somewhat knew how to request additional support. So there seems to be an area that we need to uh, sort of target. How do we make this um, additional support accessible to folks who are looking for it? Student engagement also seems to be a theme across not only families, but teachers' worries. Um, they both state that they are doing their best to engage their students' schoolwork, but seem to come a bit short. At this point, I will open up for questions and I'll Bring it back to non presenting mode. Okay, for members, are there any questions? Jim, you can start. Thank you. Yeah, this, th having read this a little bit before, but not all of the information, this is really um, stresses the experienced teachers and students who have doing have done distance learning before versus the newness of the families and teachers that are just have just experienced it now this time um, we're hoping through the uh, at least I'm hoping through the technology and teaching and Andy Kubis's department as well as John Weiser's that they will be more comfortable now that they have a good schedule and a good structure at each of the levels, elementary, middle school, and so that some of these problems can be avoided. There's always going to be some disengagement and some extra engagement and um, families feeling frustrated and so forth. As I mentioned before, and I'm sure Nellie's aware of it too, my daughter who is, is a middle school teacher 
and has three children at home that each had their own lessons that they had to deal with. It was quite a challenge for her to deal with all of her students as well as support the kids from doing it. Luckily, she grabbed a couple of older kids in the neighborhood to help do some uh, tutoring and, and encouragement to do it. And we're going to have to resort to all kinds of those things to, in order to succeed and to get through. I'm just glad Bloomington is so far ahead of the curve in doing a lot of this or being aware of all of these things that we need to do. And we're going to have to call on, as I mentioned before, grandparents, friends, aunts, uncles, whoever it is that can help out at home in order to encourage the kids that this is what they need to do because people are going to go back to work or people are just going to be demoralized, you know, and depressed that they can't really Absolutely. And just to kind of uh, uh, emphasize what you were saying, um, there, the work, the, all this information is being utilized by all departments, um, not just the quantitative, but the qualitative as soon as it comes through. And one of the requests that was made was that if we can take this family information and, and divide it up into, um, into groups of ethnic and racial so that they can look at those disparities and to see what can we focus in, just kind of like you mentioned, the focusing in on the needs and what, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. Totally agree with that. Um, Beth. Um, I had two big concerns when I read this and that was how many did not know how to find resources or kind of new. And I think when you are in a desperate situation and you're feeling overwhelmed, as many of the families were, and I, I heard this from families in my neighborhood who are very together families, and yet they were feeling overwhelmed, but that we have to have more in place. For example, um, I remember when I went on the, um, the old website and they had, you know, parental help. And it took me to the Office of Educational Equity, but there was nothing for Caucasian parents. And I felt like, so where do I go? Or, or where do those parents go? Um, and then also when it was talked about um, how many resources have been given regarding um, social emotional learning resources. It's a resource list, but is what is that list? You know, is that is that a list of who can help them with that, or is it a, a list in their language so that they can draw from that? Um, is it websites they can go to? Um, sometimes people need more than a piece of paper. They actually need flesh and blood to be there, to be able to help them pick up the pieces. I've seen moms that are just maxed out and in tears. And, and so I'm wondering, what do we do besides just throw information at people? Okay. Uh, Tom, you raise your hand. Uh, yes. Well, as a as a parent of two kids in, in Bloomington, I, I took the survey, and I was one of the uh, the minority there that said that there definitely was not enough work. I mean, my my sixth grade daughter was pretty much done with school by the time I woke up in the morning, and my son was pretty much done before lunch. But uh, I I am also mindful that not everyone's in the same situation, and there's a lot of people that were struggling. So I'm wondering if we're going into the fall and we're going to have to do distance learning part two or 2.0 how are we able going to be able to um individualize this where my kids needs are getting met but also the kids that are overwhelmed how their needs are getting met i don't know if, if anyone here can can speak to that at all Yeah, I could I can try Director Bennett. So I um, I'll be sharing in a little bit in the next presentation more information about our safe and supportive schools work, and part of that process is using um, design thinking, which is really 
working with our stakeholders and trying to empathize with them. What is it they need and want? Which I see as, you know, these first two presentations that, that we've had here tonight is really what is it our stakeholders are looking for. But the next step of the process is plan and try things out and then and then iterate, right? And 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 change as we go and as as needed. And so um, you know, I see that as being a really integral part of how we move forward in the fall. We've done things one way in the spring. Let's take that feedback. Let's figure out how we can do things differently. And likely no one of us has a, a really great answer to your specific situation, for example, that you brought up. But I do have a lot of faith in our teachers and our leaders, our site, our site leaders, our building leaders, our site leadership teams, that they can come up with some solutions around some of those pieces as well. Um, so I feel like right now the important part is to have that data so that we can start thinking more forwardly about what we're going to do next. Okay, thank you. Heather. I can never get unmuted when I need to. Okay, so um, I it's my understanding there you had you did this survey later in the year because you mentioned this one was done April end of April beginning of May. Did, did I hear right that there was another one done? That's correct. So the other one that's uh, out in the field right now uh, should be closed in the next two days. Are they the same questions or are they different questions? Uh, they're primarily the same questions, uh, just sort of uh, appropriately uh, to taking the the, uh, the time difference. So saying, yep. hey, about five, six weeks ago, we sent out the survey. What are your thoughts now? Okay. So we could potentially see some themes come out from parents that because the end of August, early April, I think we were still we had only done distance learning four or five weeks. So by I'm I'm excited to see if there's any significant changes or if it was the same themes <laughs> in April as it was at the end of May. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I um, I want to empathize with the parents. I you know on the one where you had all the different uh, quotes, the families that wanted school to end early. That was me right there. This was uh, very long um and challenging in our home and i think my perspective is that it funda fundamentally changed the relationship between parent and child because my children would after a couple of days they'd see me walking towards them and they'd be like i'm done i'm done don't ask me if i'm done with my assignment i'm done so like i couldn't be their parent supporting their work at home i was now this teacher coming to check on i don't know how to describe that well but it really, I think, changed relationships at home. So I don't know how we uh, address that or uh, uh, take that into account when we're working with parents and their students if we do have some form of distance learning in the future. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments about that? If there aren't any other questions, um, um, this really leads into um, the presentation that Jenna's going to make. Um, but uh, the second major theme, other than um, the uh, engagement of students, was really the supports for social emotional learning so so that really leads in well to jenna's presentation and, and we thank you all for your great questions yeah thank you dr heister and i also wanted to ask you in regards to the surveys um are those also going to students yes um uh, holia do you want to talk about the student surveys a little bit absolutely so the student surveys are closed already um they were uh, asked questions about distance learning of course um, so we have fifth graders eighth graders ninth graders 11 and 12th graders um, that will be looking uh, for both quantitative and qualitative information so once the qualitative survey, uh, results are done i think uh, one of the um, key areas that we want to focus on is having some type of triangulation between parents teachers and students to see what are the common themes that we see either around things that are working well or things that are not working well uh, so that we can kind of have a really good idea of where we can move through uh, synergistically that's great yes thank you but it seemed like you had another question there no okay well we just want to say thank you to both of you for that um awesome presentation a lot of good information and all the work you've done around it uh really appreciate it it's, it's 
it's very helpful, um, meaningful information that will help us as we uh, receive the, the fall, our students in the fall. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we're gonna move uh, to the presentation that Dr. Jenna Mitchler has for us today. Uh, and that one is the Safe and Supported Schools, our second session with our um, Assistant Superintendent. Thank you so much, Chair Corman. So I will admit I'm having a little bit of trouble tonight for the first time with um, some of my tech pieces. So I'm hopeful here that I'll be sharing my slides. If somebody could just, um, if somebody could let me know, can you see my slides verbally so that I could hear you? We can see it. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. And I'm going to hope that I don't freeze up. That has been the problem a little bit here tonight. So first of all, thank you for this opportunity to talk again about safe and supportive schools. We talked about this a little bit at our school board meeting on Monday, and that was just a short session, just an overview sort of of the work that's happened with safe and supportive schools this past year, which was really a lot of uh, taking stock of what we have in place right now and starting to think about what we need to do in the future. Um, ironically, we uh, probably the way we started things in the fall with figuring out what we needed to put in place has shifted quite dramatically over the last couple of months as we now have some really different and unique needs, but that's all important for us to consider here, here tonight. So I have a couple of object objectives for us with this session. The purpose is first to review the different focus areas for safe and supportive schools. So again, these are things that I shared with you at our last meeting at the school board meeting, but I wanted to talk a little bit more in detail about those three focus areas tonight. And then the second purpose of this presentation would be to discuss the school board leadership. And so as you think through your roles as school board members, uh, it might be helpful to think about what, what responsibility you might have or might take with some of this work around safe and supportive schools as we move forward. You know, I heard a lot of really great questions both tonight so far and during the school board meeting on Monday of last week, uh, questions just about, about fall planning and what we're gonna do when we get back to school in the fall, what things will look like, what we're considering. And so um, that, that engagement is really, makes me feel quite optimistic. And so I'm excited to talk through what, what role the school board might take with some of the safe and supportive schools planning. And then uh, the last item on your agenda tonight is for you all to discuss your, your goals as a board for next year. And so I might just uh, recommend a couple of priorities for you all with regard to safe and supportive schools that you could consider taking up when you start to discuss your goals for, for next year. So I just wanna start um, with our mission statement. Of course, it's really great for us all to be grounded in our mission here in Bloomington Public Schools, but we all know that we are working hard to develop in all of our learners the ability to thrive in a rapidly, really rapidly lately, right, changing world. And so what's underlined here is all of our learners because the focus with safe and supportive schools is that we have a safe and supportive school system for everyone, and that truly means all of our students and all of our staff and all of our community and families as we try to support their students through their, their learning journey. We're all familiar, I'm sure, with our, um, our vision here in the district, our pathways to career and college, but keeping in mind that as we build out the most safe and supportive school system possible, what we're really trying to do here is help students achieve their goals to get to their various milestones uh, sometimes called the, the subway stops here at the bottom of this map. So how can we really make sure that we have students coming into preschool, for example, ready to, ready to learn and engage in their learning there, all the way through career and college ready? How can we ensure that they are ready for that next chapter through creating a safe and supportive school system? At the meeting last week on Monday, I mentioned that there were three key areas for safe and supportive schools that have surfaced over this past year. So before I go into detail about the three, I want to just mention again a little bit about the process. So um, I had mentioned when Director Bennett asked a question earlier around engagement and how we can meet the, the personalized needs of, for example, his, his learners and his household. Um, and I mentioned we use a design thinking process that starts with empathy. So we did start with looking at a lot of stakeholder feedback this past fall, 
we can think back all the way, feels so long ago now, but we collected lots of data through uh, surveys that were sent out at the building level. We looked at some of our student survey data, the Bloomington data that had come in from the previous spring. Uh, we looked at data from our staff with regard to our PLCs, PLC facilitators. And through sifting through all of that data, we were able to identify three key themes. And the first of those three is the climate of care. So we really recognize that we need it and we do need in Bloomington Public Schools to make sure all of our students, staff, and families really feel cared about. As we sifted through the data that we uh, had identified as being a part of this theme, a climate of care, we also noticed four specific areas that related to this. So the first is we want to make sure we have mental, physical, and social and emotional health supports for our students, families, and staff. We want to make sure that we have spaces that foster that sense of belonging and nurturing for, our, again, all of those stakeholders, students, staff, and community, families. We want to make sure that we are truly respecting and caring for all uh, that results in positive relationships and positive behaviors within our, our schools and make sure that we are communicating with our stakeholders in a way that ensures equitable access which reminds me of a, an earlier conversation we were having as we looked through some of that survey data around making sure our families have, have information about where to go, right, or, or know where to go to get information, to your point before, Director Beebe. So that's the first of the three key themes is that climate of care. The second has been identified as tailored instruction. And maybe, Director Bennett, this gets at a little bit more of what you were saying, is we need to have learning opportunities that really are personalized for students, staff, um, with regard to professional development, of course, for staff, and then community, if we're sharing information or, or working with community and families to help them understand and navigate our school system. Universal design is mentioned in this first item, and uh, my hunch is that this surfaced in our data because we've been doing a lot of work around universal design, especially within our uh, special education um, department and classes. So universal design being the idea that all students, regardless of need, deserve access. And so as we think through, for example, a student who maybe has been identified for needing supports around emotional and behavioral as a, a category of, of special education service, we can make sure that we're providing them with the same access to what they need for their learning as a student who maybe has not been identified with that need. So that's what we're talking about when we say universal design. Really key to this work is that we have tiers of support that provide differentiation and allow us to customize the instruction for students. So if this is a new idea to you, tiers of instruction or tiers of support um, and viewing audience, uh, the idea here is that we provide a tier one, so something for all students, regardless of who they are, where they come to us from, and that there are always going to be some students that need a little bit something in addition. And so that would be tier two, something on top of, an extra scoop of something for their, to meet their needs. And this could be on the end of the spectrum where um, students are needing enrichment, or it could also be um, students who are needing some sort of intervention to help supplement their, their learning. And then we also have a third tier, which would be few students who need, um, in addition to tier two, something else. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about tiers of support. And then thirdly, being responsive to strengths, needs, interests, and aspirations of all learners, which may sound familiar when you think about our personal growth plans, for example, in our district, trying to think through what we have in place and how we can strengthen and continue and grow in those areas. The third and final area that was identified this last year through our work with engaging with stakeholders was meaningful engagement. Again, something that's come up over and over already tonight and that we've seen uh, in our data as we were having the, the last two presentations. So within this area, we really want to make sure that we are valuing, recognizing, and elevating the assets that each person brings to our community. So one really good example of this, I think, might be if you think about language. Uh, at times, it may seem to some that language is a, a challenge or a barrier, and it truly is for navigating systems, particularly when the systems are built around the English language. Uh, but in so many ways, language can be an asset too, especially if, if the home language is not English. And so identifying ways that we can elevate that as an asset for our students and families. 
trying to ensure connections for all learners to and within their community, be this maybe through service learning projects, through volunteering uh, and other ways, partnerships. And then lastly, opportunities for collaborative problem solving and identification of um, problems and then solving them together. Gets back to the empathize piece of the design thinking, making sure we're really hearing from our stakeholders. So those again are the three key components of safe and supportive schools that have surfaced this last year as we've looked through the data. What I've done then is I've taken the five areas of school board leadership that come to us from the Minnesota School Board Association, MSBA, and I've taken a little bit of a deeper dive in the next couple of slides into a couple of these, a couple of these areas. So MSBA identifies these five as what they call standards for school board leadership. And you might imagine coming from learning and teaching in my, my past life uh, and being a teacher myself who had worked with curriculum review, I saw the word standard and thought, oh, this sounds like curriculum and curriculum review to me. Um, so under each one of these standards, MSBA also provides benchmarks, which is much like academic standards and academic benchmarks. So what I've done here is a similar process to what we would have done during curriculum review, which is identify a couple of key standards that may be priorities for us moving forward. And the three that I've identified with regard to our safe and supportive schools work are vision, accountability, and advocacy and communication is the, the term that's used for MSBA, um, but I'm calling it engagement here. And that's a conversation that uh, Rick Kaufman, uh, Dr. Heisted, and Dr. Cesar had, uh, we all had together. And we had said engagement really feels like the, the right word there to be using. So those surfaced as maybe some areas to focus on in the future for, with regard to school board leadership. Now, I, we don't need to read through all of these benchmarks, but I did want to have them listed in the slides so that you all could see what the benchmarks are under vision. So you'll see things that look familiar to you, right? Like looking at uh, focused and attainable measurable goals around student achievement, developing a strategic plan, regularly monitoring that plan and evaluating progress, ensuring that our belief statements, our mission, our vision, our goals and objectives are all, all reflected in our policies, our budget planning, our implementation efforts, and supported throughout the district. And then lastly, for vision that we communicate the strategic plan and progress to the community. So in looking over these benchmarks, I took the liberty of uh, picking one that I thought might be helpful to focus on for safe and supportive schools work. And that one that I, I selected was D. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why. So D again just says that with regard to school board leadership, role, the role of school board is to ensure that the school district belief statements, mission, vision, uh, statement, goals, objectives are all reflected in the policies, mirrored in budget planning and implementation efforts and supported district wide. So one thing you might focus on as a board if you were so to choose this as a priority would be thinking through how Bloomington Public Schools Safe and Supportive Schools plan and especially this, this really important piece of it, which is our, our equity work, cultural proficiency, are reflected in the school board policies, the budget planning, the implementation efforts, and supported throughout the district. Uh, if you were to write a goal in this area, I think uh, it, it would probably be very helpful to specifically call out the piece of our plan around this cultural proficiency work, which is the name of our, our framework and our tools that we're bringing into place here in, in Bloomington Public Schools. And I just wanted to, as we're thinking about this, I wanted to reference an area from uh, a book, Cultural Proficiency, that will be using to help do some of our work here in the district together. But there's a line uh, in the middle of the first version of the book that talks about culturally proficient schools. And within a culturally proficient school system, each participant has a definite role to play. The roles may overlap at times, but they retain distinctive and characteristic. And there's a breakdown of the different roles for school leadership. School boards role within leadership within this cultural proficiency work is stated as being sure to review and change policies as the student population changes and to maintain a culturally proficient environment. It also lists a school board priority and role with culturally proficient school systems is to establish policies from a culturally perspective, a culturally proficient perspective. 
So as we think about that, I think um, being sure to call out cultural proficiency in your goals might be something that helps us prioritize it at the district level then, and then also at our, our site level as well. The next area that I had mentioned is accountability. So remember I said three. Vision is the first, accountability is the second. So again, here there's um, two benchmarks, recognizing the duty to um, the board itself, the district itself, the community, and determining whether authority is delegated to the super, or determining how authority is delegated to the superintendent, evaluating the superintendent's performance, using student achievement data or other indicators, which is key here, when available as the basis for assessing progress towards our school district goals and compliance with policies and laws, and then recognizing the distinction between monitoring data and management data, knowing that there's lots of different types of data we're using in our district, um, but there's some data that if we report it to the school board at the school board level, as I had mentioned, it becomes a priority for the board and, and that's obvious, so then becomes a priority for the district and priorities for the sites as well. So with regard to this particular standard, the benchmark that I had chosen to call out here as it relates to safe and supportive schools was C. Um, I had mentioned using data, that student achievement data, and other indicators. And so what I might recommend here, if the board were interested in doing so, is that you think through uh, perhaps your desire to see other indicators of student uh, success in our district. And so some of those things might include, for example, uh, attendance. I know that's a little bit different right now than it looks uh, typically during our, our uh, traditional schooling, the way it's been done, but looking at attendance over time might be helpful for us in knowing how engaged students perhaps feel or how welcome they feel in the school schools. Uh, another item you might consider looking at with regard to data um, under other indicators here could be our student survey results. So every three years, the district gives uh, a student survey, um, but in the in-between years, we also give a Bloomington survey to our students that have some of the same items. And that was something that you heard Dr. Cesar mention um, today during his presentation as well, and Dr. Heisted. So these could be some of the data points that we take up and look at with you as a school board so that we again see these priorities reflected at the board level which would then mean they'd be reflected at the the district level and then at the site level as well i just want to add that if we were to add other indicators like these as something that school board uh, takes up and starts to look at on a on a regular basis we might we might see them reflected in our world's best workforce report for example um, and we might also see them reflected, although you may not see them at the board level as much, but in the site plans. So each, each site in our district creates a plan at the start of the year for how they want to address some of their needs based on their data. And so we might see them as um, in the past, they've taken up data around MCAs and MAP scores. They might also then begin to, to look at some of the data around student the student survey, for example, and say, Engagement's important to us. Let's think through a plan of how we can how we can uh, achieve higher higher engagement at our site as well. So that's for accountability. The third and final standard that I had mentioned was advocacy and engagement. So again, multiple benchmarks here, focusing on community wide concerns and values that support equity and student achievement further developing communication strategies that build trust between the board and all of the other stakeholders, utilizing community relations strategy that supports the flow of information, engaging in building relationships with the public and, and private stakeholders and advocating on multiple levels. So with regard to this standard around adv advocacy and engagement, I might surface A, which is focus on community-wide concerns, values, and I've highlighted and underlined here needs that best support equity and student achievement. So we've seen a lot of needs just through the survey data that we looked at tonight. But some of the things we might think about are how might we continue to gather this data from our, our stakeholders? How might we ensure that we continue to hear from them, not just now during the summer as we're building out our, our thinking for the fall, but on a continuous basis, even perhaps when school goes back to somewhat of what we, we might call normal. How can we continue to hear from our stakeholders regularly? And then the last piece of this that I'll mention is just um, as you're starting to think about your goals for next year, 
I think it would be really helpful if we could continue our journey together around cultural proficiency. And so perhaps you might, might take up a goal that's something around taking part in professional development regarding our equity and access work, which, as I said, is a foundation to our safe and supportive schools plan. So that's what I have for you tonight. I am going to try to stop presenting and see if I can still stay in the meeting without freezing up, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, questions, comments? Heather. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Mitchler, for that fantastic information. Um, I, as I've mentioned in many meetings and you guys will learn about me over uh, time, I'm very data driven. So I like uh, when we have examples of evidence-based or data-based um, decision-making. So I really appreciate that you mentioned that in there. One of my questions is, um, is, isn't a, is attendance already a factor in our world's best workforce? Because I thought that when the Department of Education added some uh, non-academic benchmark or something? Is that something that we already evaluate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the North Star report, which is something that um, you can see reflected on MDE's website, does report out on um, some of the things that I, met, I mentioned. So they have student survey data there, they have the attendance data, discipline data. So some of these other pieces that I'm suggesting we maybe add to our rotation in terms of the data we're reviewing. The difference is, um, although they appear on MDE site as part of our um, district's report card, as it's called, mm -hmm. uh, it's not always something that we report on in our world's best workforce goals. And uh, part of the trickle down effect here would be that if we were to include this as part of our world's best workforce plan, these safe and supportive schools metrics, um, we would also be seeing them probably then uh, listed on some of our site plans. So for example, if we know that the school board is going to be looking at student survey data and that it's uh, it's valuable to, to the, the school board, then we would also see the principals and their building leadership teams picking up something around um, that data and making it a priority for their plan for the, the coming school year as well. Okay. I have a lot to say about this, but I don't want to get too far in the weeds. Um, and I also don't know how much of this is going to be later in goals conversation. So I'm going to hold on to some stuff, but I'll, I'll probably ask you some, some more questions later. Okay, we'll come back. Um, okay. Jim. Hi. Yeah, thanks, um, Jenna, for bringing this to us. As you all know, and I've referenced this before, this is a heavy reading book, Tom. You ought to take it when the kids are getting too much too much free time say hey come here kids look at this chapter but i've already identified several goals that from from the presentations now and i know we're going to be talking about them but but as we go through this it's just such a heavy Issues and so I, I just I just wanted to say this is really good and helpful and for you to outline it like this so uh, because the book has so many different things and they're always constantly referring to other districts and what they've done and the various tools that are in use so this is going to be good as we continue to talk about our goals for the next year. Maya. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I just, I think during this uh, <clears throat> period of uprising for, you know, amid, we have an uprising of uh, racial justice and the COVID pandemic, we have uh, a lot of um, things going on and this is a really good time, a really good time to be addressing this. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, when you spoke of a goal to have connections with the community about collecting, um, you know, having collecting community recommendations for a possible uh, outreach effort, like what do we want the, our community to look like and having some kind of collaborative process in that way? Um, is that something we could discuss? Yeah, uh, so I, 
when I originally was talking through this particular recommendation, I was working with Rick Kaufman, and I imagine he may have some suggestions or ideas around this as well. Um, but, you know, I think the key things I go back to are what policies can we look at as a school board to try to see where we can work this into policy where it's appropriate? Um, and then how can we um, how can we ensure that what we make a pro as a priority for the school board, or I shouldn't say how, it's more a matter of if we make it a priority for the school, as a school board, if you make it a priority to collect this feedback, um, then you know we'll continue to have some reports as we you know had tonight, which I think can be just really, really helpful and inform some of the decision-making. Beth. Yeah. Um Dr. Mitchler spent a lot of time with me today and we discussed some of these things and it, it helped me to realize that when we get um, data information um, that we look at it and we say, okay, now what? And with what information we get, that actually forces us to be accountable for that information. You know, so we see that, oh, it was very difficult for some of these parents to know what to do. Okay, so what do we do with that? We have to come up with a solution. And that has to be something not just for one site, but for every site. And so maybe we start looking at, hmm, how do we make those things available? What kind of policy do we have about getting the information out to the parents to know how to access the help that they are going to need? Um, and so, I guess I'm looking forward to developing those goals with the team and what we see by the information we've received in these reports just recently and also looking back at the most recent World's Best Workforce as well and taking those data points and putting them together so that we can have a better picture of where we need to head in our board goals. So. Anybody else? Tom? Yes, well, thank you, Jenna, for this, and um, I, I agree with uh, what you're saying about um, looking at things with cultural efficiency, and I, I've really enjoyed our, our professional development this year and, and our equity work and our session with uh, Dr. Trudy, and I think we've got the information, so now it's kind of like, okay, now what are our action steps going to be? And I'm hoping that our direction and our goals reflect action in that area of equity. So we're looking at policies. I mean, I know we always have a goal of review 20 policies, but I would I was already thinking we should have a goal where we're saying we're, we would look for cultural bias or any bias in our goals or not in our goals in our uh, in our policies. But then also look at our our strategic plan. I mean, I don't know how long it's been since we reviewed that, but is that something that we should look at through a, a, a equity lens and if we need to make adjustments to that and in our hiring practices and and just all those things that I think we need to kind of do an equity walk, if you will, throughout our whole district and look at specifically for any type of bias and see if what corrections we can make. And those are kind of where I think we need to be focusing some of our our goals on. And then, you know, interaction with the community. I think we need to ask our 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 parents and families and especially those of color about how they feel in this district. Do they feel that they're supported? Do they feel that there's any um, racism that exists in this district so that we can get that information so that we can, again, take some action steps to move forward. Yeah, I think that's that's right on, Director Bennett. And, um, you know, you had mentioned a lot of the pieces under the the vision with the benchmark that I had mm -hmm. identified there. The other one is around the, the budgets, right? So if you're thinking through a culturally proficient mm -hmm. lens as you're starting to do the work around budgets, too, that can be um, that can make a big impact. Right. And we know that that's something that's been kind of a, a big lift the last couple of years. And um, we'll be again engaging in some of that this year, too. And it's, it's a lot of work and, you know, I think you're doing a great job uh, leading us in that direction. So thank you for all your work that you've already done and all the hard work we're going to be tasking you with in the future. Thank you for your engagement, really. Yeah, it's good. Great. Maya? And when Tom brought up Dr. Trudy, wasn't didn't she say something, too, about that this was unusual to have a, a session with the school board? Um, you know, they, they usually do district-wide, she does district-wide seminars, but I thought that was really special that um, 
that we might be special in that way because of you <laughs> having a workshop just for the school board on, on cultural proficiency. Yeah, so thank you. You're welcome. I think it's important for, for the board to really understand it and, and um, appreciate it, right? For us to know that we can move forward with it. It's good. Dawn? I just want to thank you for your work on this. Um, you know, I've been going to workshops on different kinds of uh, tiers of support and universal design for probably 20 years already. So um, it's really nice to see, you know, some of this included, but I also feel like, you know, change has just been so long in some things. So I'm happy to see that maybe, you know, we can make some progress. Thank you. Okay, someone else? No other comments? Okay, then it's my turn. <laughs> well, um, thank you, Dr. Mitchler. This is this is just a great um, study session like we haven't had in a long time. You know, we have received so much good and valuable information and it's just a reflection of the great job that uh, you all do, you know, all the initiatives you guys bring and all the hard work that you put into those and the vision that you have for what is best for our community and for our students. It, it's, it, this, is, this is what we're seeing. And I'm very glad too to see that our school board is embracing, um, embracing those initiatives as well. You know, I'm glad to see that, that we, we seem to be, to be ready to, to take that leap that we've been waiting for for several years, I'll say personally. Um, and uh, one question I have for you, Dr. Mitchler, is uh, when it comes to uh, working with our with our staff, how do you envision the process of bringing this um, this plan to our staff members and how we're going to be developing that plan? I mean, when you think about how you're going to embed this into the your workload, how do you think that looks like for them or it might look like? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think a, a really great opportunity for me to just um, say that I am so incredibly grateful for the partnership um, and the work that I've been able to to do just in this first year in my role with uh, Dina Wade Ardley, who's our Director of Educational Equity. And so she has been um, a partner right alongside, you know, um, a lot of our district leaders for a long time and trying to think through this, um, this approach of inside out, right? How do we ex come to examine our own values and, and biases and beliefs? Um, and so, you know, through my work with her in developing out our plan, we determined that we want to have uh, three cohorts of training our staff in the district. And so there'll be a first initial cohort that will start their work in August. And this is uh, about five schools and it's the building principal from each building. If it's a second secondary school, it's also their assistant principal or principals, and then it's their building leadership, uh, some of their building leadership. So not necessarily their building leadership team, but a selection of, of leadership of leaders from that building who can be a part of the cohort. So those folks will be fully trained in the framework the four tools that the board has come to know a little bit better at that last uh, PD session. And then um, the responsibility of that first cohort is to engage in some of the training of the second and third cohorts, which will then start over the next uh, two to three years. And so at the end of our three-year implementation here, we'll have um, folks in every single building at every site who have had the full training and know the framework and the tools really well. Um, I should also say our Office of Educational Equity has the majority of their staff engaged during that first cohort too. And so we'll be doing a lot of um, work together with all of this as we move forward. Uh, the benefit to that is that we start out with a group of people who can really come to know it well and be champions of the work and then help work with their, their peers, their colleagues side by side instead of having an, an outsider, so to speak, coming in, um, a consultant or something like that for three, three years working with our staff. This really will be um, building the capacity of uh, some of our staff early on and then having them work with our staff over time. 
Um, so thank you for that question. I will say, you know, I think I think it will be valuable. I hear I hear the board saying they're interested in in doing this work, really interested in doing this work, which is great and engaging over time. Um, and so, you know, I think there's some really great ways if we were to to move forward having some metrics that would we we would use for accountability. Um, and if we could continue our our sessions with the you know as the board, I would be happy to work with you um, on some of those PD sessions moving forward. So I'm excited about the. I'm feeling optimistic about the path yeah and it, it definitely is a very important uh work that we get that you bring in here in front of us um and i think like has, like as you mentioned before because you included uh, the role of the board in this presentation to for all of my my colleagues to pay really close attention to to that specific area to what is our role in all this and moving forward as we um, continue to make progress through this plan. Uh, what is what is exactly a role? And I also want to make sure that we um, or that you pass that information to other staff members as well. That we're going to take this this work very seriously. Uh, we have tried different approaches to the work that you're bringing now, and for many different reasons. You know, it takes a while to to really kind of. Uh, get into that type of relationship with one specific plan, right? And so not every plan is perfect. So you have to definitely have to kind of chop around until you find the, the right one. And maybe this might be the right one. And it's a very, like, it looks like really well um, studied. And, and I think it's very important that, that we make sure or that you make sure that people know, that staff members know, that the board is gonna take this very seriously. And part of that is that we have already taken that step into um, having professional development sessions ourselves, studying these ourselves. You know, we're gonna be part of this plan, that you administrators are gonna be part of this plan. And that there has to be an expectation. And I would like to hear what other uh, the other board members have to say about this, but I think it's important that we have an expectation that we're all working on this and we're working together. And, and that it's everyone, you know, from the very top to everyone else in the district. So it, 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 is, it is very important that, that, that we make sure that, that there is accountability there, that there's, there's been many times through the years when we see people working on their own, trying to create their own plans and idea. And I think we need to stick to that one um, that can help us work in collaboration with each other because we're, think, we're, we're talking about the well-being of our kids. So, uh, yes, uh, Don. Um, to add to what you're saying or a question for all of us to decide, we don't have to decide tonight, but just something I, I was thinking about, I would really think it would be beneficial if we could attend maybe to the schools that were assigned or somewhere or figure out a way so that a board member could attend some of the training also in the building because it's a different conversation with just the seven of us than it is in the building. And I really think it would be beneficial for us to be part of We don't need to go to all of them because I know some people are uncomfortable with us there, but it would be really beneficial for us to be able to go to at least one or two of those trainings in some of our buildings. Um, I think it would also be beneficial to see that, that people also see that we're taking part of it and coming there and being part of the discussion there also. So I don't know, we can decide about it later, but it's just something that I was thinking about that that I thought would, um, you know, maybe be helpful for all of us too, because, you know, when we talk about it amongst us, there might be a whole different conversation that we don't know about or see in the building. And it'd be important for us to see that also. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So professional development, more professional development seems like that's what we want. <laughs> I'm not trying to speak for everyone, but I think as you know, unless somebody objects to that and says no. <laughs> but um, yeah, now going back to um, Tom's comment about the strategic plan, that's another thing that I've been also uh, I've been wondering about, and I had um, asked um, Superintendent about it too. You know, when was the last time that we looked at a strategic plan? 
Um, and I know strategic plans, the organizations go through the strategic plan every five or 10 years, depending on the need. Uh, but maybe it's time to take a look at it, to review it, to see if there's anything that needs to be added or changed to uh, the language of our strategic plan. Probably, I don't know, it's maybe a conversation. What do you think, Superintendent? Last time our strategic plan was refreshed was back in 2017. Now, I agree with, I think, Board Member Bennett brought it up. Another about the need to update our strategic plan. All the things we've talked about here starts with the strategic plan. Yeah. The second thing in the strategic plan is values. We talked about all these things are about values. Values drive how we make decisions, how we set policy, and all our goals. So the values need to be revisited because the values right now, as all of you know, are student focused values such as citizenship integrity honesty what we're talking about here is the district values so i believe that needs to be talked about and values also drive the policy development because when we talk about cultural proficiency it all starts with values and then also the metrics that we come up with all goes back to the values and then we may even have to revisit our vision our vision talks about careers pathways to career in college how does cultural proficiency and the social emotional support, safe support of schools fit into that vision? It is something totally new. All this thing takes, it's a process of developing the strategic plan. You need to engage the community. This is gonna take a lot of work, everyone. This is heavy lifting because there's some people who may not agree with this, but this is where the value statements comes in. So I think that's a really good goal for the board to take on. So I agree, Chair Corman. Okay, thank you. And we'll bring that conversation back to the table um, in a little bit then when we're looking at, at our goals. And another thing that I had uh, for you, Dr. Mitchler, and as you talk about um, engagement, meaningful, meaningful engagement, um, advocacy, uh, and, and we can have that conversation, you and I, um, sometime soon. But, um, you know, as we look into engagement in the different voices that or the voices of our different groups of families, parents, multicultural, multicultural families, um, I think it's important that we revisit what we had before, where we have uh, parent association groups uh, and that we strengthen that kind of relationship with our groups and with the groups like, for example, the Somali Parent Network. Um, so I just wanna talk about that later with you and as well as affinity groups within the school district, probably. Superintendent. I won't overdo it, but the strategic plan is the best way to engage the community, to bring them in, have a conversation with them because they get a say in what the community, a strategic plan is a document that states what the community wants. And then we make all our decisions because we have limited resources. We optimize our limited resources to achieve that strategic plan. It all makes all the decisions. So the best way to engage the community is by doing a strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else, any comments? Tom? Uh, yes, well, I just wanted to uh, say that I agree with everything Les said. <laughs> um, about the question for you, Les, is, I agree. This is a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of community engagement. And I was, you know, thinking that this might be something we want to put in one of our goal areas. But I know we're already, you know, have a lot of things on our plate. Is this something that we should be looking at in this next year, or are you more advising a multi-year process of revising the um, strategic plan? Or I don't know if you can speak more to that. The most important thing that you, the board, can do is set its goals. Now, I wanna give a heads up to everyone. This is important. There needs to be a dis discussion about the following. One is they brought up start times, right size in the budget. Negotiations is coming up next year. Oh, yeah, next year. We have a referendum in three years. When are we gonna do that? The other thing is facility planning with this whole COVID thing has changed all our facility usage. We need to think ahead what will our facility needs be 
So all these things come into play. Some of this is going to be driven by the strategic plan. The board needs to have a conversation about all this, how it weaves together, and what are they going to take, what next steps are they going to take this year? I agree, Tom, it may take more than one year, but we may want to just refresh our plan as we move toward that, because I think we need to embed some of this stuff that Dr. Mitchell talked about tonight in the plan. And we need to look at some of our values and put it in the plan as a refresh. And a refresh is just something the board as elected officials say, we need to do this now. Yet at the same time, a few years, maybe next, the following year, we're going to do a comprehensive full-blown plan. But this is just an incremental step in that direction. So yes, I, I think the, in the 2017, I think that was more of a refresh. We kind of um it was. redid our yeah, so it wasn't like a whole over right. you know, overhaul, which mm -hmm. I think we do need, but I mean, yeah, we do have a pretty full plate. So that might be the the best option. Let's do a refresh now and then take a longer journey where we do more community engagement and hear from our stakeholders and everything. Right. And what, one last thing, if you really want to send a message to the community about where the board is at and all these things that's going on right now, talking about a refresh strategic plan is the way to do it. It's the highest thing that you can state. It's higher than policies, higher than all these other thing goals. It is the strategic plan of the district. Well, the strategic plan is the base of the work that we're doing. So that was the first thing that I thought when when we started this this work with Dr. Mitchler was so what what about the strategic plan because this work needs to reflect that strategic plan that's the main thing and so we we do need to go over it mm -hmm. all right so no more questions for now or comments anything else please uh don't hesitate on reaching out to Dr. Mitchler she has very good responses to all of our questions mm -hmm. thank you Dr. Mitchler thank you all right so we're gonna move to middle school sports update and for that we have our superintendent Les Fujitaki oh. and uh, then our executive director of finance Rod Zitkovich. Rod are you here? Yeah Rod yep. is going to do the, um, discuss this topic. Rod? Yep Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members uh, at the last board meeting uh, we talked about uh, the overall budget and one of the questions that came up was uh, middle school sports, uh, what was decided on it and how it was budgeted within the budget. Uh, kind of going through the, the, the overall process of a budget in the first place is that it's why we uh, do budgeting uh, at one board meeting and then give a two week period of time in between for board members to be able to ask questions, uh, um, ask for more details and the rest uh, before doing the final approval. Uh, based on that is what happened with the middle school sports is uh, what was submitted to the uh, business office was uh, a budget from the athletic directors that did not include any of the uh, middle school athletics in it and the at the um, galaxy program there was an additional spot of in their budget for uh, taking on the soccer and volleyball areas within the uh, middle school programs. Based on that, it was uh, probably a, a bad assumption on my part uh, that we assumed that uh, based on those two choices, that it was decided that uh, the middle school budget was uh, eliminated and offset by those two other areas. Uh, based on that and based on the questions that the board had um, at the last meeting, uh, the board has um, technically th uh, three options before approving the, uh, the budget on uh, next Monday night. One would be is that um, approve the budget as is, as it was presented the other night, um, approve a uh, increase to the budget, which um, the only area, my understanding that is not included in um, the area would be track and field, which was approximately, I think around $75,000. We could add $75,000 to the budget. Uh, we can do a resolution right before, uh, the approval of the overall budget, or, uh, we can go back to the original, um, $155,000, put that $155,000 back in the budget. 
um, and the board can approve uh, that amount in the next uh, for the board uh, resolution budget resolution on the 22nd. Um, so again, it was a process of assumptions that uh, we probably should have looked into a little more detail. Uh, but with some of the other things going on, um, didn't look at it as closely as we should have. So looking for guidance for uh, Chair Corman of what the board would like us to do is parting a resolution before the actual budget resolution for the next board meeting. Okay, thank you. Tom. Yeah, so so Rob, yeah, no fault on anyone's on anyone's end here. I mean, it was kind of a crazy spring and COVID, and I, I can see why this this uh, kind of felt you know fell off. So, um, I guess my my question is, you were saying that for wrestling and soccer would be added to Galaxy. So, what is that a, at an expense? Do you know how much more that's going to add to the budget? Um, actually, it's volleyball and uh, okay. soccer that are being added to Galaxy. Galaxy is restructuring their whole budget and their whole staffing model and are uh, moving toward uh, with these programs of being able to get targeted services dollars to help offset the costs, any additional costs associated with these programs. Okay. And so it'd be looking at participation, how much participation they can get for these programs. Um, once we get those, participations they can plan out those programs once those participations come through superintendent yeah i'd like to recognize dr mitchler for stepping forward she's she saw what we needed help on as far as this middle school sport and she and dr coin worked together to and uh, with rod to make this happen so thank you very much thank you heather um so i don't necessarily want to get too in the weeds on this um but with the uh cross country and wrestling that would be expanded for the seven seventh and eighth graders to be able to participate in the high school is there any busing uh allocations to get kids from the middle schools to the high schools to participate or would the transportation have to be on their own i believe the transportation in the past for kids that are in those programs have been on their own so I would say that it would stay with, with that process. It's my understanding. Okay. And then my other question is um, the only uh, sport, so of, of the five sports that are on this chart, soccer is the only one that's not offered at all three locations, Valley View Middle. Was Valley View Middle, did it not have um, much interest or participation this year? Is there a reason why Valley View Middle is not included in the soccer option? I guess I can't answer that question why they. Um, Board Member Starks, in my understanding, the participation was not there. Okay. All right, thank you. Other questions? Beth? Um, I was wondering if the fact that we weren't able to do the spring sports this past um, quarter, if that helped to release funds that then could be used for this year? Uh, the, the, some of the costs that we saw for benefiting this year are offsetting some of the additional costs that we had for this year. Um, PPE and other programs, all those different things. Um, as you saw with the forecasted budget, we're still saying that we're gonna be pretty much a wash with uh, budget this year because of some of the savings that we were able to incur um, will offset the additional costs that we we're incurring. Other questions? No other questions, comments? Tom? Well, I mean, it looks like we have three different options. So um, I don't know if people want to start talking about what's their preferences and um, I kind of like the option of the the hybrid model, if you will, will, where we're cutting half, doing half a cut, and then keeping the track and field and, and with the track and field and cross country for seventh and eighth grade. I mean, that would probably be, be my preference, but I don't know what, what other board members, what their take is. Um, 
Don. So in that option, the we would need an additional seventy-five thousand, though. Is that correct, Rod? To to do that option. Correct. We would add an additional seventy-five thousand dollars of expenses to the budget. Okay. I guess for me, it it would depend. Before I could go for that option, it would depend where we have to get that money from, because we know that anytime in the budgets that we have, anytime we do something, we have to take money from somewhere else typically. So what it, what it would be is that we would have a larger reduction in the following year. Okay. Thank you. Heather. Um, so, and uh, Tom, I think it's just track and field that would be uh, six through 12, the cross country would go to the high school. Is that correct? Because director Bennett mentioned cross country and track and field, but I just want to make sure we're just talking about track and field. My understanding, it was just track and field. Okay. So then, um, I, this is probably not a fair question to ask, uh, <laughs> without giving you a chance to get the data ahead of time, but there's five sports that we're talking about cross country, wrestling, volleyball, soccer, and track and field. And the overall budget's $150,000. If we're offsetting four of them into different places, why are we only saving half the cost? Why are we still, why is running one sport still costing us $75,000? If you can't answer this now, I'm sorry. No, I think, I think the biggest part of that is that's the majority of the participants yeah. have been in track and field. So you have a lot of coaches within that area where the other areas, they're smaller teams and there's not as much cost associated with them. That's right. Okay, so it was the most cost heavy one was the one we couldn't find a solution for right. outside of, okay, all right, thanks. Jim. Yeah, and just to follow up a little bit more, the track and field requires a lot of volunteers or a lot of help somewhere. BAA, unfortunately, wasn't able to come up with them as they wanted to. So it's really the cost, of, like Rod said, the coaches, the timers, and all those types of things, which is many times more in track and field than it is in some of the other sports. And it's also trying to get the people to uh, sign up. <clears throat> Maya? I know that um, you said that there were only a few responses that were positive about um, the willingness to volunteer for track and field. And I'm wondering who we reached out to when we asked who would be interested in volunteering. I can respond to that, Board Member Olson. My understanding is the BEA reached out to their network, they contacted approximately 2,500 in their network, and they just got a handful of responses. And they tried, they even made personal phone calls because they really wanted to try to do it. The BA wanted to try to do it. Okay, thank you. Don? So if we did the hybrid one year, then is that, I mean, it's just a one-year fix. That that would be another concern, um, or is this something that we think we can sustain? Or is that too hard to I, answer from, today? <laughs> well, from my perspective, if uh, the athletic directors and uh, leadership within suggested that as one of the cuts, um, if they're having to make a two and a half to three million dollar cut next year. I would imagine this could be one of the items that is on the top of the list. Thank you. Um, hold on, Tom. Uh, Beth, did you have a question too? Or I thought you raised your hand. Okay, Tom. No, so Les, I'm wondering if um, when BAA was trying to, to find, you know, be able to work something out, how much of this whole COVID thing came into their inability to do to do this, you think that factored in at all? I don't know. I asked them that question, they didn't know. But they did the survey recently, it wasn't at the height of the, the pandemic, but they just said they didn't think they could recruit members, especially after they made their phone calls. It wasn't just a paper survey, it was a phone call survey too, where they 
called people. Okay, because I mean, I was thinking that if it maybe if we did the um, the track and field for one more year, it might give them a longer runway of trying trying to come up with a more viable plan instead of I mean, we were trying to you know talking to them in late winter to come up with a plan for next year, and then COVID jumped on. It's like it might be a short runway if we were to give them a longer runway. Maybe they might have able to have a a better opportunity to have a replacement plan in two years. I can call them and find out tomorrow. Okay. Because I mean, I'm I'm kind of wanting to keep this program because I mean, we've made a lot of cuts to middle school, and and it kind of seems like we're kind of beating up on the middle school kids. And this is, as you guys said, this is the most utilized, most popular sport is the the track and field. And so it's great that we're able to find solutions for all the other sports, but not having anything for this one, I think, is going to be sorely missed for for our families and um and the seventy five thousand dollars is a is a steep is a steep uh, price tag uh, i don't know if that has been what that is has been taken into consideration that we're we're cutting it by a third instead of six through eight we're only do seven and eight and that if we were to keep it the fee increases that we did for high school i would assume those fee increases would be applied to middle school so were both of those factors considered when you came up with the seventy-five thousand dollars price tag? Uh, nope the 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 fee increases for the high school were part of the high school needing to cut additional dollars, also a hundred thousand dollars. So that's why they raised their fees is to offset a hundred thousand dollar cost on their end. So if we were to match those fees accordingly, would it? Offset anything without buy us another five thousand dollars, or do you have any idea? Or um, I don't know, but you're 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 probably going to have less participation then too as the fees go up higher. Also, it's we what we see in like parking fees and things things like that. It's in in a lot of those where they have other options outside the school day and things like that. That. Um, if we if we raise our our rates so much, they um, don't participate. Yeah. Maya, is there any way to um, to make it so that it's not <clears throat> including every single activity? You know, just make it a smaller program. Because, for example, I was thinking about track and field as being one of the safer sports for. Um, for considering the COVID, you know, the running, but I don't, but, you know, passing the baton wouldn't necessarily be safe. The, the long or the um, pole vaulting might not be safe jumping onto the mat. So I'm wondering if there's a way to save money by having it be um, condensed a little bit. I would uh, defer to the athletic directors on what they could do in that regard. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so we're not taking action tonight um, because it's a study session, but Rod, is there anything else you need from so us? What I need is to be able to provide the board a resolution for Monday mm -hmm. night and also to adjust the budget if needed to be able to uh, do whatever the board uh, at least in consensus, agrees to uh, doing tonight. Okay. It's so not formal need... until you actually take a vote on Monday, next right. Monday. So we need to come to an agreement. Um, comments? Other comments? Tom, you raised your hand. Well, I was going to say just what, what Rod said. We, we have to give people let them know which way we're going. And I already gave my opinion. So I think the other six people need to give their opinion. Okay. Beth, you said hi. In, in the back of my mind, <clears throat> excuse me, is this thought of accessibility to all students. And um, if students are going to have to, you know, get their own way over to the high school, who's going to be allowed, 
to participate. Given fees, are there any ways that we scholarship based on free and reduced lunch for students? Um, and, and also thinking of um, when Trudy uh, was sharing with us about how if you look at participation um, and your minorities are not in something, why is that? And so I'm, I'm trying to weigh these different things. And in the process of doing that, I'm thinking, are we, are we really gonna make this accessible to the students that we want to have have it? I would love to say yes, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think it's gonna be limited access um, because you have to go to another site and do you have a way there? Um, the things that will be at the schools are volleyball and soccer at Oak Grove and Olson with just soccer at Valley View. It's something. So I'm trying to weigh, does anybody else hear what I'm trying to say? Or is it confusing to you too? I see a nod, I see a uh-uh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Heather. Um, Beth, I'm struggling with the same things, and and you know, as we were er talking earlier about looking at things through an equity lens, I think that's where I'm struggling with that because if we are having um, sixth graders can't participate in two sports altogether, and that the seventh and eighth graders have to get themselves to the uh, location to participate, that definitely is uh, there. Those are barriers. Um, the fact that Valley View Middle School doesn't have a soccer option, I just want to make sure that it would still be potentially uh, on the table if the um, desire was there for a team at that school. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then track and field, you know, we're looking at keeping it regardless. So for me, similar to what Beth's saying, I struggle with these changes. So I would be in more in favor of just keeping all middle school sports for one more year recognizing that a lot of work has gone into trying to make this work. Um, but also recognizing too, we don't even know what fall is going to look like. Are we even going to have extracurricular activities? We're going to have intramural sports. We may be making decisions that don't even become reality in the fall. Um, so I would err on the side of just not changing anything right now and seeing what our reality is going to be um, and making decisions later. Um, but it's more that equity lens piece that is giving me pause. Other members, Don. I agree with all of that in that the equity lens and how will people get transportation, but I also weigh that with we also know that if we brought that entire amount back, then that budget was from the high school budget. That means that they would have more cuts to the high school for staffing. That was what was presented to us then. So also having to weigh that piece of it. So are we, you know, are we adding another layer of class size, higher class sizes, et cetera, to accommodate that money? Or are there been enough changes because of COVID that we wouldn't have to do that? Those are all some of the questions that we're trying to weigh because things are so different now. So I don't know if you can answer any of that, Rod. I don't know. The cost changes, as I mentioned earlier, the cost changes would be is we would use an additional $155,000 worth of fund balance this year. It It's too late to be able to change anything else in the budget at this point in time. So it becomes is that what we'd have to do is um, that would be an, an additional $155,000 that would need to be cut from uh, the 20 or 2000. 2021-22 budget. So it would not affect class size for another year, but then we may drastically affect um, the budget for the next year. That That's kind of what we have to weigh. And ongoing budgets, I guess. Yeah, but, well, the cost of it is approximately one and a half FTE of a teaching staff. At each school? 
No, or at total, total, total amount okay. at $155,000. Okay, thank you. But Brad, that is if we continue as full, is that what you said? Offering? No, uh, if, if, we, if we continue everything, $155,000 is approximately one and a half FTEs of teaching staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tom. Yeah, I just wanted a clarification, going back to, to Beth's comment about how the kids from middle school would have to go to the high schools. Well, that's only if we eliminated, if we did the full cut, if we did the the hybrid, the partial cut, those, those um, the sports would be saving would still be available at the middle schools, correct? Correct. The, the track and field and the soccer and volleyball would be there. And we already have in place scholarships for 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 families, correct? Yes. Okay. That's one of the just clarification on that. Heather, I think I saw your hand up. No, sorry, I was just responding to Tom. <laughs> okay. Right. Any any positions here, Beth? So I guess I'm a little concerned because I heard something about Galaxy has um, revised their budget in such a way or restructured it so that they will be able to cover um, volleyball and soccer. Correct. And, and so what impact does that have on the budget? What does it take out of... Um, what we would have had to take out of the general fund. So if it's now in Galaxy and it used to be in this other part, how much did this cost? And now it doesn't cost this, but Galaxy is taking it on. No, the Galaxy is part of the general fund budget total. So what it is is they restructured their budget, reducing some staffing within their budget okay. to be able to make things work. So it has okay. no effect on the general fund. Okay. So, so Galaxy is reducing staff, but they're going to take on volleyball and soccer? Beth, allow me to help with this. Yeah. If Galaxy... Galaxy was going to start an intramural program. They would attract more students to, to that program. This is an after-school program. Yeah. Each student generates their own dollars. Oh, The okay, state yeah. gives money for this after-school program, and that's how we we're going to cover it. If the students don't show up, the expenses go away, the revenue goes away. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Well, I think it's also important to make the distinction that these aren't the same type of program. Soccer in Galaxy is a lot different than middle school sports soccer, where you're pretty much playing, you're in a conference and you're playing other school districts, whereas intramural, intramural would be more like scrimmaging within the schools, or maybe you might have like, you know, Valley View versus Oak Grove, but you wouldn't be playing in a conference with other school districts. So it's not, yes, they're taking on soccer and volleyball, but it's not at the same level, it's not the, it's not nearly the same as as a as a middle school sports program. But you know, as as Les was saying, that it might attract more students because it's it's gonna. I don't think there's even a fee for the students, or it's very minimal, so it'd be cheaper, and it's right after school. And so there's a lot of aspects that are good for an intramural, but also you can kind of um, make it more for the whole child, with not just sports. You can also tie it in to academics and academic support. So they could work on tutoring and mentoring and character development and soccer. So there's, there's a lot of benefits for, for doing the intramural, but it's not it's not like apples to apples. I don't know if that helps or just adds makes it more confusing. <laughs> no. no, it's okay. Maya, I was thinking we haven't even we haven't thought about how a hybrid. Um, hybrid classes are going to look with after school athletics. Mm -hmm. If the kids are going to school half day and then having to come back for athletics, or if they're going 
two days a week or, you know, we have no idea what, what's going to happen, as Heather said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anything else? Because I think Ratnitsa, it's a better idea what, what would happen in that resolution. We feel that we have yeah, I enough. Think what I'm hearing is either like two is some of the people are saying just just having the 75, and some people are saying to keep the whole program. So, yeah, I think we have to go around and say which one we prefer. So Rod has a better idea. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, let's start with who wants to start. <laughs> you can volunteer to start. I will. Okay. I go for the 75,000 plan. Okay, that's that. Tom? Oh, yeah, that's where I started from. I'm still, I'm still in the same plot, spot. You're still there. Okay. Wants to go next? Don? Does that mean we just call it the Bennett plan now? I'll go for the Bennett plan. No. <laughs> We Couldn't help it, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I agree. I, I'm on that 75,000 too. Okay. Who's next? It's Jim, I'll go along with the Bennett plan. Got to have somebody to blame. <laughs> you started credit. it, Tom. Or get credit. Yeah. Uh, Maya? Okay, I'll I'll go with the Bennett plan as well. I was very undecided, but um, but yeah. Heather, uh, I still want to keep them all, but you've already got quorum, so yeah. And I will go with the seventy-five. As long as we don't call it the Bennett plan. <laughs> Yeah, that that's why, I, see, that's why I called it the seventy-five thousand, not, not the Bennett plan. Okay. Well, can I say so actually, we'll, Rod? Uh, we'll, uh, Rod presented that, so really it was Rod's plan. So we're just giving Tom a hard time, but Rod actually brought it first. So. <laughs> well, and the only reason why you guys are joking is because of the study session, right? <laughs> I can make that clear. Okay, so Rod. Yep, so we'll do the resolution before the actual budget resolution for uh, eliminating the um, other programs and tie them into either the high school and or Galaxy. And the only part that's being kept is the uh, track and field portion of $75,000. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for bringing this back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we're going to move to the board goals, the board and superintendent goals 2020-2021 discussion. So we all have that document that uh, I think we'll start with the board goals. I'm trying to find my own. Madam Chair, could we uh, yes, have like a, like a five minute break, you know, a bathroom break? We've been going for almost three hours now. <laughs> That sounds good to me if everybody's willing to stay an ex extra time because I think we were planning until 930. But considering that we're talking about goals, that might be a longer conversation. Yeah. That okay? I don't want to okay. rush it and I'd rather everyone be pressed. So let's take a five minute. Five Thank minutes. You. Thank you. So uh, 
let's look first at the school board goals. So we had the school board goals from 19, 2020 that were approved last year. And uh, you have taken a look at them. We, uh, we had study start times in our governor, governance area, in operational oversight. We have provide support for innovative dis district projects and negotiate new contracts. Then in the policy area, we have review and update 20 policies if needed. Uh, in the community engagement area, we had continue to implement the updated community engagement plan of December 20, uh, December 10, 2018, plan for board succession. And then we have the superintendent relations uh, with collaborate with the superintendent and achieving the above goals. So I'll just leave it open for discussion. Heather. Um, can I just respectfully ask for the benefit of those that might be watching that don't have this in front of them i mean i can i just pulled it up i can screen share mm -hmm. um just i mean you just went through them verbally but i think anyone that is watching this conversation might be helpful for them to be able to see it as well yeah would someone help us bring that document up um somebody who's now part of the board maybe a member of the administration that can just help us presenting it if, if you happen to have it in your packet Dr. Mitchler, do you have it? Yeah, Chair Corman, I'll look for it. If you have an opportunity to share it with me too, and then I will I will screen share it as soon as I get a hold of it. It's fine. Okay. Um, give me just a second. Um, if you want to start the conversation, I can share it with Dr. Mitchler while you you guys are talking. Okay, so go ahead and start the conversation, board members. Um, and somebody, I can't, I'm not able to see you, so just go ahead and start, because I won't be able to call your name. If you raise your hand, I won't be able to see you. So I'm going to work on sharing those with um, Dr. Mitchell. Well, if we start at the top, under governance, is that what it is? Yeah, governance. Yeah. We have the, the start time study, we're studying start times, and obviously we didn't complete that, but it's kind of hard to know if we want to do a second year of that before we get the results from from Dr. Julio, and Dr. Dave's uh, research. So I don't know if we should just go ahead and continue on with that goal or if we should wait until we hear back from them. I don't know what other board members think of that. Yes, Heather. So, well, can I just can I ask a before we go into the details of these, can I just ask a bigger, broader question, being that this is my first time going through this process? So um, when, when I've been through organizations where we've been setting goals, the goals that we have on here um, are, for lack of a better word, anemic in that they, it's just one phrase and there's no action items that follow. There's no uh, log of evidence, you know, to say like we've, we accomplished it or we didn't, or we got halfway through. Um, and like, Number three, the review and update 20 policies. That's just, in my opinion, the work of the board. That's not necessarily a goal. So will we have an opportunity to talk overarching about what goals are, or are we literally just going through each one separately and saying, yes, we achieved it. No, we did not. We're moving on. We're just adding to the same, um, the same five categories. I guess I need I need I need something to structure this conversation first before we just dive in. Okay. Um, those of you have had previous experiences being the chair. Can you tell us a little bit how this process went before? Sure. We we kind of did. Well, there was another one, board evaluation that we did, you know, self-evaluation for a board that we did. It's almost about the same time. But we sat down and we talked, we made a big list of all the different thoughts that we had about what would be good goals or what do we want to have for goals. And then we kind of just narrowed them down and then we rewarded them. And then we brought them into the board, the board's role in the goal statement. So as we went through them, that was pretty much, you know, people's ideas about, okay, now, do we want to go through and start listing all kinds of possible board roles again, or are there enough of them? I realize that one of them is probably going to be incorporate some 
cultural proficiency somehow and do strategic another one would be a strategic plan update and another one for goals for an annual goal to so uh determine if that would be something that the, the school board um will um that the school board would uh would pursue so um we started with that and we had a process and um, and so we need to determine because we were unable to finish that process if that's something that we want to continue um, to having as a goal in our list. Don't. Well, like I said, we have to wait until we get the results. We don't we don't know if we want it as part of a exactly. goal until yeah. we get the results of the study. Yeah, done. I just wanted to ask, try to answer what I know of the broader question that Heather was asking about goals. Mm -hmm. um, I was not like a parent that attended all board meetings before. So I can't say that this was for sure. I saw it with my own eyes, but what I was told is there was sometimes some boards didn't have any goals um, because they weren't able to actually um, ever agree on, on their goals or get together on goals. I don't know if that's quite accurate, but any organization, anything that I've been involved in, um when you do goals you go through the old goals first to see if there's anything you want to continue because otherwise you're not i mean the goal's worthless if it doesn't get done and 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 you can decide if you don't want to continue it or not but but there's no point in having goals and just changing completely new ones every year and never completing them mm -hmm. so um you know to have that continuation any group i've been in has gone through the old goals and then after that, determine which ones they want to keep. Then they go through the process of determining if there's any new things they would like to add to it. And um, Tom, you were going to say something. That's all right. um, I, I agree with what, uh, what Don was saying. Um, I think um, when we went over the safe and supportive um, plan, I think uh, Jenna outlined some possible goal ideas. I think it's also important to hear from from Rick and Les and, and Jenna on under each of these categories under governance, what they see coming down the pike and what they would recommend. And and we don't just have to have one in each goal area. We could have several in governance, but I think we kind of need to hit the ones that administration is saying, okay, we really need to be looking at, you know, the the changes from COVID and you know schools and how that's gonna impact. So that needs to be a goal area. And we got to, and then when we get through that process of what the high priority ones, then we can maybe move on to the conversation of, okay, if we have extra time, maybe we can add this one as well. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and and I agree with that to a point. These are board goals, and we've had discussions in the past. Once we get board goals established that we feel are goals for the fall next year. And um, and what we they might include. Then we call on the superintendent and others to work with the superintendent's goals or the superintendent's initiatives on how they plan to assist us in our goals. You know, as we as we say, this is what we think we want as a goal, um, and then and then that gives them at least some uh, uh, opportunity to look at them and maybe tweak them a little bit for us or else add to their own list of what they want to do and see us. You know, the, the biggest one, of course, for the superintendent's goals is to make sure that the board does does uh, well and works with the board. So, you know, that's kind of another, um, he needs to see what we want to come out with before he recommends, oh, you should really do this or with Jenna and and Rick, no, you got to have more of this. So, so that's what's kind of difficult to do is how are we going to come up with our goals for 2021? Superintendent. Yeah, I want to help out by sharing how these goals were developed and why they're developed. The ones that are the, the 1920 school board goals. The first is governance, uh, study start times. A number of community members came forward. They were pushing us for, and board members were pushing for a start time study. So it's just one, one phrase there, but what happened was the board 
chose to establish a start time committee. They put three members together to work on this thing. Board members chose to wait, my recall, until after election before taking action because if the board's gonna change, they said, why do this thing? And if the composition of the board is gonna change on such a controversial topic. But what happened when January and then all of a sudden COVID start, anyway, the, and it just, we didn't get much done. So we were trying to do all this research, gather research, but we got sidetracked. But that's how the start that study came up. And then now, as far as this uh, thing about support innovative projects, the board talked about that the mission statement called us to be educational leaders. Well, every time we keep looking at what kind of innovative projects we can come up with. And the one thing we've talked about is the two projects or three projects that we want to be innovative on this year was the special ed information system. The other one was PGP and the third one was ACT for MCA. Those are three big projects. Some of this would require legislative support from the board to get it done. So the board just said, so those are the three major things. But there are strategies behind each one of these things. It was just wasn't with one-liners. The other thing was on policy. Not too long ago, we the board wasn't updating the policies. Some of the policies were over 30 years old, untouched. In fact, David Holman told us we were actually at risk because the, the policies were illegal, what we we're stating. So the board took a lot of time working on policies and then they said well fine let's do 20 20 a year is a lot but then they said let's so they've they've actually ground through these policies maybe now the policies the policy committee the foreign policy committee is pretty good shape now maybe we can drop down but there was a while where the board says we need to stay intentional and really focus on this thing and clean up our policies that's the reason why it's there and community engagement, all of you know, we have a community engagement plan. We started the Bloomington Pub Public School Advocacy Council. There's things that go on every year, and that, that was an area the board wanted to focus on. They said, this is what we need to do. That's how we came up with these goals here. Now, we have a whole new discussion here, a bunch of other goals. It depends. I listed down probably 10 or 12 major goals that the board could take on. It's just what's the capacity of the board? The board has to talk about this thing. What do they want to focus on? You have only so much capacity to take on. And so that's how we could have had a much longer, robust list last year, but we just said, look, we just got to focus on this. That's my recall. The main ones. Yeah. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, Heather, you, have, you raise your hand. Well, I just, so one of my questions is, are these five overarching categories stagnant? Do you always choose a governance and operational oversight or do those change as well? Uh, yeah, go ahead. When we had a professional development session before with uh, another company, Cheesebrow, uh, Teamworks International, they told us that these are the five categories we should look at. They were so those are the five major categories. So that's how we built our strategic plan and then we built it around these five major categories. And that's where how the goals were set based upon that training. But that was a while ago. It's not simple, but we have to follow these five. Don. I just wanted to add that, you know, in the in the world, the world is always changing, but we've seen a lot more in the last few months than maybe in other years. And so things that were a priority before may not be a priority when we get done with these goals. So we may be changing all of them, part of them. Those are the discussion we have to have. So, you know, definitely um, things that we thought were maybe the top priority are, you know, way down in the bottom 10% now. I don't know until we talk about it. So. Right. So we need to, to have a discussion and determine which one of those we consider uh, necessary to keep at this point, or if we need to make additions. Beth? Um, yeah, I mean, with all the changes that have happened, um, I mean, we, we really, last year we were thinking we had gotten information, we started reading literature about school start times. And then we said we want evidence 
um, to see if this helps with learning. And if it doesn't, then we don't want to pursue it any further. So um, when we have our meeting this week about the start times, then we'll have the evidence to know if, if it's something to go either way. But as a chair of that board, I'm also suggesting that right now we're just concerned about how kids are going to get to school and if we're going to have school and what that's going to look like. So it's almost like we need to table this until school gets back to a more stable place where, where we're, you know, normal again as far as how schools function. Um, with a specific start time, um, without all the complications of COVID. So um, that's something we have to discuss when we have our meeting on Wednesday. But um, I see that one as one that may need to be tabled just in light of other emergencies. Well, Maya, Maya. Would, our, would our goal be changed now to deciding on how we're going to do the hybrid model or the distance learning instead deciding you know making decisions on what we're doing this fall no i think our our goals are more broad than that um that's more of a management um, area where that then that will be brought to the board but um in, when we look at the uh, the goals, we're looking at at, at the broader uh, side of it. It's you know what are the main things that we want as a school board seeing happening in the in the district, um, and then we look at our superintendent goals based on those board goals. Um, right, Jim? and um, just to to reiterate, kind of what. Les is saying there are the five categories of the board's role, governance, operational oversight, policy review and update, community engagement, and superintendent relations. Now, under those general categories, we can put a lot of specifics or a lot of, you know, different types of things that fall under those, uh, those titles. And so I think that's what we probably need to uh, concentrate on is what should those goal statements and board engagement of those uh, general categories be. Yeah, with this um, study start times, as it, as it says, it's a study. So what we initiated last year was with the intention of studying that possibility. Uh, and that's something that we were not able to accomplish because of the different situations that were already mentioned. And so this year we haven't been able to get there either. We haven't been able to get to the findings of the research yet. And that's what we will um, hear in, in, the next, uh, in the next meeting. So the question there would be, do we, well, I guess we have to keep it there because we still haven't accomplished that, the study part of it, and maybe just consider it to be temporary until we make a decision on whether or not we continue with it and then have it open for maybe dropping it later? Thoughts? Sound good, Tom? Okay, so is that okay with everybody? We just keep it there in the list until we make a decision because we have not completed the study and part of that study is the information that's gonna be brought to us in the next weeks. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I imagine it's with all that's gone on with COVID, there's a lot of people aren't reaching their or meeting their their goals um, in other districts as well. And I can't imagine dropping it because it might be come something that we could pick up in the future too. Right? Superintendent. Sure. Mm -hmm. My recall is this, when the start time committee, subcommittee of the school board met, they said, that they wanted to make sure that we're looking at this not for qualitative reasons. They want to look at quantitative reasons, and they wanted to look at whether student achievement was affected by changing the start time. How was student achievement affected by changing the start times? So Dr. Caesar said that he thought by using Minnesota's 
student survey information, he could answer that question for the board. Unfortunately, he's dependent on the state to get that information and they were slow in giving him that information. He was waiting and waiting and waiting. They kept putting him off for good reason, but, and that's why he finally got it. And now he's digesting the information. That's why it's so late in the year. He had originally planned to get that in summer of last year, or in October, September, October of last year, and be able to get it done for the board. And I kept telling the board, I'm sorry, but we didn't get the data. The, the committee, rather, that we didn't get the data. That's my recall. And the, and the committee was fine. They said, yeah, let's just wait. We're going to have a change over the board. Let's just wait. That's the information. And so now it's at the 11th hour. Julio said he has the information. He's going to share it next week or this week with the board committee. On Thursday. On Thursday right. Or is it Wednesday? Thursday. Thursday. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and we totally understand, you know, all the different obstacles that were on our way and everybody's way in the past year. Um, okay, so we keep it there. Okay. All right, let's go to that operational oversight. But before we go out, is there anybody that has any um, recommendations for any governance type goals that want to add throw up in the air for consideration? Anyone? You will learn. Okay, do we want to go over the new ones, the new additions before we decide oh, okay. to put something in there? Or we just go through the list and decide whether or not we keep it so that we start dropping things maybe that are unnecessary and then we can fill them with other ones. Yeah, I'd rather that. go through the whole list first. I okay. agree. Thank All you. right. So well, I, I didn't know if you were done with governance. Let's just move on. We'll keep that and let's go on. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, we'll okay. come back to that for sure. There's a lot to talk about. Okay, so that number two, that operational oversight. Um, so superintendent talked to us about that innovative district projects, uh, negotiating new contracts. So any thoughts on that, superintendent? Any recommendations? I think I think those should be replaced. We have a list of other things that can replace them. Okay, so we're good on that because we we worked hard on, in all those different areas through the year. Don, well, I just had a question though. Are we still through the state uh, innovation zone? Do we still have that? Is that expired? When does it expire? I can't remember. Two years, three years? Uh, we're still innovation research zone pilot district. Okay. We, for how, how long is the pilot for? How much, how long, how much longer? I believe we have four years left on our. Okay. That's right. So we do have to do some, we do still have to support the things that are part of that. Uh, we it's operational. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions on that? those two? Well, I would like to add the strategic plan in there. Uh, uh, if, if, yeah, if, if, superintendent. Uh, that should go on the governance. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to get ahead like Tom said, but that should go there. Right. Let, let's let's do the dropping first, like we talked about. Yeah, let's get through the list first. Okay, so we're good taking those two out of there. Are you guys comfortable with that? Taking those those two items out of number two, out of operational oversight. Just to say that we are still in negotiation with one of our bargaining units. So we're hoping that that will come to an end, but that hasn't been achieved yet. Superintendent? And Chair Corbin realized we're going to start negotiations January of this coming school year. Mm -hmm. Tom? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to what Heather was saying earlier, it's like that's the work of the board. I mean, does that need to be a goal, negotiate new contracts? I mean, were we not negotiating new contracts? So I don't think it really needs to be in there because it's a given. We, we have no choice. We have to negotiate new contracts. We don't need a goal to, to hold us to it. I think there's statute that holds us to that. Uh, Superintendent? The idea behind that is the board would sit and develop parameters for negotiations. And that was a board. Yeah. And they would, they would talk about the high level stuff like, do we want to do back to back contracts? Do we want to do a Me Too contract? Do we want, those are the, discuss, the high level discussions that we needed from the board, the philosophy behind contract negotiations. And that's why we had it on there because. All these questions keep coming up. 
And do, do we differentiate benefits? We keep coming up and then we keep talking about this. And we said, we really need to do that up front before we get in the midst of negotiations then start talking about it. We need to have one way for the board to talk about these things is it. We're going to stick to these things and this is what we want to achieve. So can we reword that then to not just negotiate new contracts and then instead of saying, you know, devise um, different some negotiating strategies or something? Because yeah. it, it just sounds like that's just a, it's a given. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Are, are we good with that? We drop in, provide support for innovative district projects and we keep the second item, but under a different name. Good okay everybody okay good let's go into number three policy review and update 20 policies if needed okay discussion around that beth i know that we are getting close to um completing the amount that we needed to get done but maybe we should have a different perspective um when we're looking at the policies to look at them for cultural competency, mm -hmm. um, to have a different focus as we look at them. Right. Okay, so uh, Tom? Yeah, I agree with, yeah. with what Beth just said, but I, I would think that um, my preference would be able, would keep this one, but then add another one, you know, to examine goals through a lens of cultural efficiency or, or check for, for bias, but I, I would, as Les was saying earlier, doing 20 policies in a year is a lot. And I think that I usually continue that. So I would like to keep that 20 benchmark. Do we need it as a goal? Maybe not, but I think it might be worth keeping and then just adding another goal under there about the cultural efficiency. So we're talking about keeping the review and update of policies, but under different conditions that we will bring up in a, in a little bit. Is anybody opposed to keeping that one? I'm not Don. opposed. I'm not opposed. I just thought of something. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm fine with adding that language in there, but I would hope that we've been looking at the policies through that lens all the years that I, you know, that I've been on the board already. So, um, you know, I guess stating it is different than, than saying that we were doing it, but, but I'm just, I'm thinking, you know, I think the majority of us were looking at those things every time we read a policy and every discussion we had. So. That's a good point. I think it's, well, Tom. <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. I, I'm, we should be yeah. transparent in the community. This is what we're doing. We're looking at our, we know that cultural, you know, that there's racism that exists in public schools. We're, we're cognizant of that. We're not trying to hide the fact and we are being mindful of that. And we are examining our policies to do everything we can to root out racism in our school district. So I, I wasn't, think- I wasn't arguing, I wasn't arguing to take it out. I was saying I agree with the language, but I was just saying, I'm hoping that all of us as board members were already doing that when we looked at them, that's all. I wasn't arguing to take it out. Okay. All right, are we good there? Seems like, Heather? <laughs> yeah, you look doubtful. <laughs> I just, this this process is kind of driving me batty. I don't, I don't know how else to say this. It's also 925 and we've been in a board meeting for three and a half hours. It's, it's, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. It feels like middle school um, classroom cuts all over again. Like I'm overwhelmed. I don't understand what we're doing. I, I didn't feel like I was really prepped very well for today, you know, and to not have, here's the process we're going to go through here. Are the things you should have come to the meeting ready to go. I, I'm really struggling with how we're making these decisions. Um, and considering this is one of the biggest pieces of what school boards do, it feels rushed and um, and I'm frustrated. So I'm just putting that out remember there. That, remember that we're not making a decision tonight. This is just the discussion around it. Just want to make sure you right, remember aren't we that approving them next. Aren't we approving them next Monday? Because I, I don't think have a board. 
we don't have a I board meeting it, in July. So we're either approving I them next Monday or we wait till August. I think you'll get a, an email with them all summarized though and that kind of stuff after the discussion. So I just wanted to make sure you understood. Yeah, and I and I can understand how that might feel frustrating uh, for our new board members as well. I think it's, it's part of that is probably the fact that this is the way that it has been done through the years, where we we meet once a year and we have this kind of discussion as we go over that process. But we can always look at um, other ways of, of of you know having this process done, and also at the end of each year to go back to our our goals and and see which ones have have been met before we move into the next year with the new goals, which we have also done. Yeah, Beth? I don't know about you all, but after three hours, I start to have a hard time concentrating. And, you know, we've had more of these four hour meeting sessions and it, it's draining. I mean, Les has to go back to work tomorrow. Um, and, you know, we don't, but we need to be creative. We need to be able to think clearly. I, I actually feel as though we've left something very important to the last part of our energy for the night. And um, I also understand what Heather is saying because um, every time we do a new thing, it's like it's a new protocol. And there, there's no handbook given to new board members about what that protocol is. It's mm -hmm. just put in front of you and you're like, okay, how's this going to go? And you go to the meeting. And, and I've been thinking about this, that, that some of the questions that Maya and Heather have had or apprehensions they've had have been due to the fact that there is a lack of direction. And I'll be honest, I think one of our goals needs to be that we come up with a school board member handbook to know what is coming and what is happening because it takes a long time. This is my third year and I'm starting to get a hang of it, but it's all kind of catch it as it happens and try to learn it. But it doesn't come around enough for you to really um, internalize it until you've been on it for a bit longer. And um, I think it's a disservice to new board members looking back um, you don't know that you have the question until it comes there. And then you're like, oh, am I supposed to know something that, that, that everybody else knows? And, and so, and maybe that's part of the mentoring process is where the mentor goes ahead of time and says, this is the next thing coming up. This is what we need to teach you about this. And when this comes up, this is the process that we go through. So, um, I, I'm, I'm frustrated that it's 9.30 at night and we're dealing with this. I would really like to see us do this at a fresh time. Uh, okay, I understand the frustrations and the concerns about time and it's, it is our all our last um, item, but uh, then the question here is, are we moving forward with this? Because this is something that we had set as a, as a weak goal or um, completing it so that we can also um, continue with our professional development. And, and this is a good conversation, you know, it's a good item that you, we can probably bring to our next session with MSBA. That would be also my recommendation that we have those type of conversations when we are there. Maya. I was just I was just going to say that I, I really appreciate <clears throat> I appreciate what you're saying, Beth, that um you know, because you were the newest member before us, so it's all fresh in your memory <laughs> that you're very supportive of us as being new. Um I also, as far as this goes, I am pretty much trusting the the people who have been on the board. For a while, I'm just kind of going along with trusting them. So I'm okay. I'm okay completing it since we're almost done. But um, but uh, I'll go along with either one. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I better give my historical perspective again too. We've gone through this before, and I don't know if we really need to have. Um, an action item on this coming up. 
Um, some of the things that I've gone past back into 2018, 2019, we did have under study start times, it talked, well, just to say, for instance, we did talk about several options. Then as we went on to new projects, we had several options underneath there. They didn't necessarily get into the final goal statement, but at least we reviewed them. We had the facilities plan. We had uh, a variety of other operational things that we did do. And in the community engagement, we wound up with about three or four different items under that. And then we we um, narrowed it down to this one. And the same thing with plan for board succession. That was done, you know, in order to take care of the fact that uh, Dick was leaving in. How do we do that? So there are some more things that can probably be submitted underneath each of those five categories if if we had uh, fresh minds and ideas to do it. So I guess from a superintendent's standpoint, I don't think we need to have an action item on this coming up in June, do we? Superintendent. I'll make sure. My recall is this for this process was that we would have a multiple meeting process where this would be discussed because we have new board members and because of all this discussion that's taking place we wanted to do the safe supported schools work it's 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 what we need to do that's why we brought up the strategic plan refresh these are big things the board needs to take more than one session and if it needs to be we may i'm going to say it we may need a july session to do this work because we have COVID, we have all this stuff for fall planning that's coming up, depending on what you decide on the on a board goal, could mean that we have to work, start working with the board in July now to prepare for fall. So all these things, I thought it was gonna be multiple sessions that we'd have a conversation with the board about. I didn't expect to finish tonight because of all these things. And the board has, one of the challenges the board's gonna to have to do is prioritize. There's so many things to do. <laughs> Right. The board has only so much capacity. What's the board going to focus on? And then if you give me 15 items you want me to do, I'll work with you to help you be successful. That's then I'm going to have to pass it all down to the teams that are already working. Yeah. All yeah. So yeah. so all these things, it's one of those things you, you said that I come back, I talk to the team and we we do this kind of cycle back and we talk about what's what's realistic for everybody. Mm -hmm. so. Tom. Well, there's nothing that says we have to have these goals approved in June. I mean, nothing. we could come back. Yeah, so, I mean, I would rather it's not rushed, but is everyone at this point fried? Can we no longer have a conversation? I mean, we've been waiting to have the conversation. Now we're, we're having a conversation about having the conversation. So can we at least have some conversation and then maybe do another session yeah. in yeah. July? Yes, because yes, my concern would be that there, there is there are some uh, projects in place and in order to be able to move forward with those projects, we also need to have this part clear with our with our goals. And we're also having the MSBA um, professional development session too. And so it would be helpful to complete those before we go into that PD session with MSBA as well. So we don't have to go too deep into this, this, this kind of document, but if we can at least have some sort of an idea of what is actually necessary at this point for what we have in the list and what would be some of the things that we will add, if we can at least have that and then have further discussions on, okay, what, what does that mean and how we're going to do it? Beth? Yeah, I... I um... I agree. I think discussion is great. Making a decision, I just don't feel like we could do that that tonight. And I'm glad to hear from Les's perspective that it's over a series of meetings. If we need to meet in July, then then let's do it. To just it's it's so much coming at us with with the COVID and um, uh, just the tension that is within our community right now is really high, and so. Um, I think it's really important that we be thoughtful about this and open and listen to each other. Um, listen to Les, he has a heartbeat that he hears from out there as well that we need to take in. Um, 
I appreciate that. Don, thank you. Bye. I just wanted I just wanted to say, can we either continue the discussion or quit? Because we're have valuable amount of time here and we're talking about how long we've been going and we spend all this time discussing whether we're going to keep going can we either just do it or or be done i would like to either continue or or be done with the meeting let's get yeah. make a decision well, and do it right well let me ask everyone um, how many of you would like to continue the discussion tonight is that fair to ask i'll say yes yes have... <laughs> okay gone maya says yes I think we have at least four people who would like to continue the discussion. Okay. And we have two people that are preferring that we continue another time. So we're going with the yes. Okay, good. Let's go with the yes. Where were we? Uh, okay, decided that we're going to keep that item for now. Okay, that's what we talked. Let's talk about community engagement. And for that, we have two different items, continue to implement the updated community engagement plan of December 10, 2018, and plan for board succession. Maya. Okay, so that's something we don't know what that is, right, Heather? <laughs> yeah, Superintendent, can you uh, address that item one, one more time? Number four. I can. <laughs> yeah. Don, yeah. Well, I can just say that it's my bad. It's my fault we haven't met because we haven't had a meeting during COVID since this all started. So um, the committee hasn't met to look at the plan and really discuss um, where we are and if we want to update it and things we want to change. So we have to have a committee meeting. Um, I would say that we still have to continue whether we update it or not, we still have to continue to implement whatever community engagement plan we have, whether it's the existing one or an updated one. So you could just leave that, continue to implement a, a community engagement plan. Anybody else, Tom? Yeah, if we're gonna keep that one, which is fine, but we might wanna put in there, continue to implement the updated school board community engagement plan, because it's different in community engagement plans, and I think that might be confusing. There's a, a district community engagement plan, and then there's a board one. So which one are we talking about here? <laughs> very good, because people have been very confused about that. Good catch, Tom. Good one. Plus, it looks funny to say updated plan of December 2018. Well, we can just say continue to implement the, the school board community engagement plan. Mm -hmm. Beth? And then um, this is one where we'll need to discuss more because in light of COVID and in light of the surveys and information we just saw today, there may need to be additions made um, for this unique season. Okay. I agree with that. We're good in there. Um, plan for board succession. Is anyone planning on resigning this year? If no, then we probably don't need that goal. <laughs> I agree, we don't need it. <laughs> what did you say, Maya? I have to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> There's the day. Were you were you hoping some of us were gonna say yes or what? <laughs> There's just okay, the <laughs> I guess, I guess like in the fall of 2021 though, there will be an actual election where, um, you know, if that is for my seat, Don's and Tom's and Jim's. And but those are legacy seats. They don't go back up for re-election. We're just, we have those for life. So we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you think so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right. let's move on. <laughs> okay, so we agree we don't need that item in there right now. We can always come back if something something yeah. unusual happens. Um, then the last one we got here is superintendent relations, and in that we have collaborate with the superintendent on achieving the above goals. Comments. That's another one that I think that's that's a given. I don't know if we actually need that 
explicitly written in in the as a goal. I mean, if, if we're not going to collaborate with them to achieve, then what are we doing this for? So I don't know if we need to, you know, spell that out. That's just my opinion. Anybody else? Heather? I agree with that one. I, I think that's, and I don't want to derail the conversation again, because I already did that once, but that's where <laughs> um, this also, you know, like I, I, I'm struggling with the difference between a goal and like your plan of work, right? Like the things that we should just be doing as a school board every year all the time versus the things that are unique to this year. Because I feel like the goals I, I even struggle with keeping Don's with the community engagement plan because at what time are you going to take that off? Right. So for me, the goals are what are the things that we want to get done in the 2020 2021 school year, period. Everything else is just stuff that we should be doing anyway as part of being a school board. So that that's another place that I'm getting kind of caught up in this is, you know, because I feel like we're keeping things on here that aren't necessarily unique to this school year. So maybe I'm seeing the goals wrong. Maybe I'm not understanding. That's totally possible. I mean, this is this is hard as a first year um, person to do it and to be doing it. I can't even like smile at y'all and say, you know, and see your reactions and stuff. So it's a tough conversation to have digitally too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So any other thoughts? Should we? Can I can I just on? clarify one thing? Since um, yeah. they maybe everybody doesn't know this, but the community engagement, I think it got on there because um, that's relatively new. There wasn't even a community engagement committee. It was newly formed. Um, I don't remember what year, but in the six years that Tom and I've been on, it was formed. So I think that's why it got on there because it was a new thing and it's only been revised once. I think we've only had two versions. So um, it's relatively new. Excuse me, may I say something? Yes, Mrs. Bunkle. Um, we did the school board community engagement plan was updated in February of 2020. And I'll be happy to share that with the board. That would be great. I Thanks. thought there was a more recent one, but I didn't know when it was. So I didn't want to say anything, but I did think there was another one, but I didn't know it was February. Thank you. Seems so long ago, doesn't it? You're welcome. Okay. No other thoughts about that one? So we're dropping that that specific line. Collaborate with the superintendent. Because if we have this item, superintendent relations, that means that we will probably have to come up with something else. So maybe it's it's a different we're looking at it from a different perspective or um just a new goal or because this is just one part of the five items as les had mentioned before that came came out as a result of professional development of uh, suggested um, points that we could have for our goals mm -hmm. as board members mm -hmm. okay good all right so let's Let's go back because I know that everybody wants to go back and give ideas of uh, what other possible things we might want to see included in the school board goals, new things. So Tom, you start. <laughs> you have your your ideas, you wanted to go for it. So go for it now. Oh, well, I think if we're going to go to the top of the list, we go back to governance. I think we, we decided we're going to keep that study start times on there, at least until we get we hear from uh, Dr. Julio about what um, what that tells us, but then also we need to put in the the um, safe and supportive schools. We need to implement that, and we need to revise our um, strategic plan. And that's going to be a lot. I don't know what else we want to add to that. <laughs> I agree. Strategic plan will take a lot of energy and a lot of meetings. Um, Beth. Should we say begin uh, working on the strategic plan overhaul? Because um, it will take time. And I think there's going to be a lot on our plate this fall. So it may not be until things settle a little bit with COVID until we can actually address that, but um, to begin the process. Tom? 
No, I think uh, as Les was saying earlier that maybe we do the revision, which is a lot less work. And then so maybe that would be our, our goal this year, revise the student or our strategic plan. And then maybe next year, the year after that, we look at overhauling our strategic plan. I don't know, Platz, if you wanted to give us any input on that. Les. The last time the strategic plan was refreshed was December of 2017. Okay, that's when we changed it to Pathways to Career and College. We haven't touched it since. That's about two and a half years ago. So it's time for a refresh. Makes sense. What you heard tonight is critical what we talk about the safe, supportive schools. It's going to be needed. It's also going to frame for everyone what the position of the board is with respect to this cultural proficiency, all this thing that's going on, all this drama that's going on. It's a good reference point for everybody to say, here's where we stand, here's our values, this is what we mean. And that's why the refresh of the strategic plan, to me, is critical at this point. But it's up to the board. The board needs to talk about this thing. Um, who's that? Jim. And one of the other aspects of the strategic plan with the vision and everything else like that, we have to include all kinds of stakeholders. When we we can re refresh this one, but when we get into a new one with cultural proficiency and some of those other ones, we have to include stakeholders. So we wound up having a group of about 40 that developed this strategic plan, including staff, stakeholders, and everybody else, citizens. So that is going to be a sizable uh, uh, task, you know, when we get into doing that, when, whenever it is. Heather. So I had mentioned this earlier when we first started the conversation about, um, I did my homework and I looked at other school districts, um, board goals and such, and a lot of them have, uh, you know, like for example, you'd have study start times and then you'd have three things that you want to accomplish under that. And then whatever your body of evidence that you're gonna to use to say, yes, we accomplished that goal or not. So mm -hmm. what I would like to suggest is that um, like the study start times, the, the start times subcommittee, when they meet on Wednesday or Thursday, maybe they come up with some more robust uh, action items regarding their goal. And then same thing with strategic plan, because we could talk all night about all the different pieces to it, but that could maybe be a superintendent chair, vice chair decision that they come up with what are the, you know, one, two, three action items that are gonna get accomplished this year versus what could be accomplished long-term. Um, just cause, well, it's how I think, and I know that's not necessarily how everybody else thinks, but it just helps me frame as to like, what exactly are we doing this, this fiscal year, this school year, however we frame it. Um, but I don't think that necessarily, I don't feel like I need to have an opinion on how the school start times or the um, strategic plan details work that can be other folks jobs if that makes any sense yeah yeah i would agree that the the wording of it uh then we can work into the, the the details of it of each one of those items um i do think that the strategic plan it's it's an important component of the work that we're doing here and i think it's important to include it in that uh in that first item of governance um, so that we can help our administration also to start working into this in this plan. And, you know, superintendent has used the word refresh. Uh, we're not necessarily looking right now into going deep into changing our whole strategic plan. This is not what we're doing. We're just uh, revising, we're just uh, refreshing um, maybe some of the items that um, would be needed in, for, for us in order to uh, develop the further plans. Um, yes, Mr. Kaufman. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, this has been a great conversation this evening. I know it's, it's getting late, but um, I just wanted to weigh in a couple of things as I'm listening to the board. Um, I think what's key need to be kept in mind as you develop the, the, your goals for next year is the pandemic isn't going away anytime soon. And in fact, um, we're, it is highly likely that a second wave is going to hit uh, the states that have not uh, been hit. Um, that's going to impact our community. It's going to impact, uh, impact our, our staff uh, and our families. And it's going to, in many respects, look like last spring or this most recent spring. Um, and some uh, epidemiologists are expecting that it will actually be worse. 
Um, the other thing is, is that um, with the pandemic, or, or now we have the really the what's been thrust upon school districts, particularly across the country, but here in Minnesota, is as we've been talking about cultural proficiency and social ju injustices, and these are landmark pieces I think the board and the district is going to wrestle with, as well as our community for the foreseeable future. So while um, there's a lot of great ideas being put out there in terms of goals, I just want the board um, and all of us to keep in mind that um, we, we may be setting up a lot of uh, goals that will become, become unattainable because of the uh, what we don't know and what we're about to face. And so um, be, be careful about choosing too much to, to bite off right now. Yeah. And I think we definitely need to uh, focus on this um, safe and um, supported schools plan. Um, but definitely it's, it's something it needs, to, in my opinion, should be going in that first item. Um, so because it's going to show our commitment to this plan for this year as we started and um, for the strategic plan and then once again my concern would be that maybe we're missing something some specific line in the strategic plan that might be on the way of accom accom <laughs> accomplishing the um the safe and supported schools plan so if we can just, and that's something that we can look at with administration. You know, if the board agrees that and we can uh, maybe do some something in that strategic plan that uh, doesn't necessarily include a long process. It doesn't have to be a super long process, but if we need to do some sort of quick refresh in there that is um, that is meaningful and well done. So would that be okay with everyone if we address that as we added there but knowing that we are not going to go through the very deep process of it where we look at the vision the mission and every single one of the items but you know we have talked about the values superintendent brought up the, the, the conversation about the values in the strategic plan and in in looking at those values um might be very helpful as we go move forward with, with our next plan I just don't see how we're going to support our safe and supportive schools plan without looking into that refreshing of the strategic plan. Okay. I see people nodding. Is that okay? Yep. Yep. I agree. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, anything else? Not in, not in that first item not in the governance item but in any other items that um heather well i know that at the beginning you talked about that you you know you've set these five pieces as your as your structure for goals but as we've been talking it sounds as though the safe and supportive schools really is the overarching conversation for everything here right the policies we talked about doing that in you know could you i don't want to say flip the goals on their head but i don't know i don't know how to say that but if that's going to be the it, it feels like if the safe and supportive schools is just one of 10 things we're not necessarily showing that it's the most critical or the most important Hmm. Thoughts on that? Sure. I don't know if that really is the most overriding right now. Like I said, we we probably should have the other meeting in, in July, and we need to find out um, Highstead and company about, you know, what the – and Kaufman Associates, how would the next – batch of surveys is going to come out, you know, and what we do for school, the actual start of school, how we're going to play the school hybrid or whatever it is. Then once we get 
some of those basic things done, how we're going to structure our schools, how transportation is going to be done, then I think we can go into uh, incorporating the uh, uh, cultural proficiencies in those um, plans as they develop. When we look at that, um, when we look at that of safe and supportive schools, and while it's not the only goal, it just seems to cover to be part of every one, uh, each one of the other goals that we have in there. Because as we talked before, like in policy and the review of our policies, I mean that is related to the same plan. Uh, when we talk about community engagement, and we saw in the plan as well that was presented by Dr. Mitchler, um, it is part of this, it's part of the advocacy and the engagement. And so it's already there. Um, all those components will be already in each one of those items that we're seeing. I think it's basically by putting it there in that first item, we're just um, saying openly that we're making a commitment to that to that new plan, to that new direction of how things will go. And um, as we look into the fall and what the fall and what fall is gonna look like in terms of returning to school or not returning to school and all the different options that are presented in front of us, uh, we're also gonna need this type of work. So it just so it's all related to each other. Tom, you were raising your hand. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we've kind of given administration kind of what our priorities are, which seems to be like we really want to get into the safe sports schools. We really want to get into the, the refreshing the strategic plan, and we really want to focus on some cultural efficiency and moving on with that. So being that it's like 10 o'clock at night, we've been here four hours, I don't know if that's enough, and then we can just go ahead and hold off until July, and then we can see what Maybe we'll have more information on what school is going to look like because, you know, depending on what COVID's doing and what the, you know, MDH is saying, that might drive what our goals are going to end up being. So I don't know, unless you guys want to keep on talking for another half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we got it in that third item, we got it pretty clear what, what the intention of the board was. So I think that administration can help us with that. Um, yeah, a superintendent. You can't hear you. Turn on your mic, Les. Okay. Chair Corbin, would you be open to another meeting in June? Oh, yes. Talk about this while it's fresh. Yes. <laughs> because so can we have, yeah, can we have a meeting when we only have those two items, these school board goals and the superintendent goals? I would recommend it. Okay. That sounds like a, a plan. Yes. Everybody in agreement with that. So I think for now we are done. So thank you everyone and thank you administration. If there isn't anything else, I think we can end our meeting here. Okay. Thank you. Good night, Have a good night. Okay. Good night everybody. Thank you everyone. Good night. Have a good good night. night. Thanks for all your input. Bye Julio.